Hey, hey everyone. Um, hey, Patrick. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Um, so, Patrick, you and I don't really know each other. Um, like, we haven't. Uh, we've we've kind of you know seen each other on campus a couple of times. Um, is it weird that we're kind of getting to know one another right now online? It's not weird for me. I mean, I feel like I, I grew up uh, in the 90s, uh, you know, being in way too many online chat rooms back then in AOL and like virtual worlds and stuff like that. So uh, so this actually feels very normal to me in a lot of ways. And it's true. Like, I mean, we met we've met a few times in this context and on Zoom and stuff like that. Um, uh, but it but it is a different way of meeting someone that I've been in some kind of proximity with on campus, but just not intersecting up until now. So I, we learned that we share a view about introductions. We both think introductions are boring. Why yes. are they boring? I think they're boring because you can just look them up online and you can get somebody's CV or intro and background. And a lot of the coordinates are the same regardless of who it is. I mean, stories are much more interesting than profiles in a lot of ways. Mm. Yeah, or maybe it's also just that the kind of information you're being given is like you kind of can't take it in auditorily. Like you're, less, you're hearing qualifications and they just kind of, um, kind of float past you, like the title of someone's book or something like that. It's like you're not, it's not the right context for you to be getting that information. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, but we are, we are going to do a few introductions in a minute, but before that, um, so one thing that's weird to me about getting to know you like in this way is I feel like there's this difference between um, kind of being with someone like, like being with them in a space and being together and um, and then something like a kind of shared loneliness where you're you're sort of alone together. Um, and it's that second, like that, I've had that second experience a lot. I've been online a lot over the past, you know, few weeks to as a sort of way of not being lonely. Like, let me be online, let me be on Twitter, let me talk to people. But it's like this, I, I have this feeling of like, it's not quite community, it's like shared loneliness. Does that distinction make sense to you? Like between shared loneliness and community? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think with like, you know, network sociality, it just depends on what platform you're using and what affordances that brings with it, right? So like, you know, synchronous Skype or Hangouts or Zoom conversations have one kind of mode, right? I mean, there is a kind of presence with slightly less bandwidth in terms of the amount of information that I'm able to read from your, your face or your body with like better resolution. Or you have like ambient spectatorship on Twitch where a bunch of people hang out and look at the same thing and they can chat, but like you can also be a lurker and just sit back and take stuff in together. And that I think is similar to what you're describing. Or, you know, I mean, there are other forms of network sociality too. There's like um, the kinds of exchanges you would have on Grindr or Tinder or various online sex spaces, which offer a kind of intimacy without as many risks. And that can be very present where people are available to one another, but can sign off whenever they want, which you usually can't do in quite the same way um, in face-to-face -face conversations or interactions. And what do you think that element of like um, risk or the ability to sign off, like how is that connected to um, this question of like the shared loneliness? Like, like, why does it feel more like shared loneliness when there are fewer risks? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's true with, with like most online platforms, especially if there are enough people, you can be, you know, relatively anonymous, um, even though like your the reputation that goes with your handle, your avatar or whatever it is, like accumulates over time. So then you can't have total anonymity relative to who you are, but you can at any moment, if you get uncomfortable, you can uh, sign off or, um, or you know, put down your screen or something like that. And admittedly, you can run out of a room when you're there in person, but generally <laughs> social conventions are such that you probably don't make a dash for it every time that you feel um, uncomfortable. Um, but there is, I, I mean, there, I don't even know that it's loneliness. Like I, I sometimes just feel a sense of like, ambient sociality or alone togetherness, which is uh, a term that uh, Sherry Turkle at MIT mm -hmm. used, for instance. And like alone togetherness can be like, I don't have to show up in the same way, right? I can be more chill. I can, there, there are fewer uh, stresses being put upon me in terms of performance, uh, but I can still be with other people and get some of the benefits of, of togetherness. Mm. I wonder what's like, so a form of alone togetherness that I really love crowds 
and I love um, being at coffee shops. I particularly love really crowded coffee shops, like um, in the div school, like basement coffee shop. If you're sitting there, you're kind of squeezed between people because there's not a lot of space. And I love that. Um, I love being with people that I'm not interacting with. Um, and like, how is that? That That's kind of alone togetherness is very different from say, you know, watching a Twitch stream or something like that. Um, what what would make the one appeal to someone as opposed to the other? Well, I think in a coffee shop, which I really like too, I mean, you have like, you have the white noise, you have the capacity to turn off completely and just focus on what each of you is doing independently, whether it's like work or play. Whereas with this other mode, right? I mean, I think of something like Animal Crossing New Horizons, which I imagine some people in the chat room right now have played over the last few weeks, right? I mean, this is a uh, an online video game in which like you engage a number of very, very chill tasks. It's not a particularly difficult series of activities, um, but you have other people there in the background doing the same thing. And, and that becomes a shared text, right? In a coffee shop, you don't have a shared text mm -hmm. or something, um, a series of aesthetic protocols and elements that you have in common uh, that you can have some kind of shared conversation around. Mm. Yeah, okay, good. So I think that is right. It, there's a shared physical space, um, but there's not a shared thing that it's about. Let me uh, let me take a step back now and do a little bit of introducing. Um, I'm Agnes Callard. I'm a philosopher. Um, uh, I teach at the University of Chicago. Um, Patrick, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Patrick Goda. I'm a faculty member in Cinema Media Studies and English, and I work on stuff like video games and digital media. Okay, and this is Night Owls. Um, this has never been Night Owls before. Night Owls usually happens um, on the third floor theater of Ida Noyes um, in a crowded room with people hanging out together. I usually have to say like, quiet everyone at the beginning, which I didn't have to say today. That's kind of how we were able to jump into conversation. Um, so what we're doing this quarter is um, Night Owls Online. We're going to have events like this every week This at this time. And you can see in the bottom of the screen Night Owl's blog. Um, so if you want to the schedule, um, there's a big team of Night Owl's people. Uh, normally I thank people at this point. I'm not going to thank them all individually because the team has grown to make all this possible. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you, Team Night Owl's. Um, and um, I'm going to say some a quick thing about this platform that we're using, Crowdcast. So the way that it works is it's sort of, I would describe it as somewhere in the middle between like Zoom and Twitch. So if you've used Zoom, everybody gets a little box, right? Um, and, um, but you'll notice that you all don't have little boxes, right? So then in that way, it's more like Twitch where there's like maybe one or two people on the screen and there's like a chat, right? Um, but, um, but the way that this is, um, uh, go back to Zoom is that any of you um, can jump onto the screen with us, um, but, but not not a, not by your choice, in fact, not by my choice, but by the choice of the host. Um, so after like the, Patrick and I are gonna talk for 40, 50 minutes, and then, um, uh, and, uh, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. And the, the way that the questions are gonna work, um, and you can see there's an ask a question button at the bottom of your screen, is that um, you'll be um, you'll be kind of called up, and you can you can say yes or no, okay? But you'll be called up onto screen at some point um, for um, your question uh, uh, to ask it, and we'll answer it, and then we'll go on to the next person. Um, so I want to introduce um, one other person, okay? The person who's going to be doing that, Ashlyn. Can you make yourself visible? Is Ashlyn? Ashlyn, you introduce yourself. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashlyn Sparrow. Oh, no, what happened to my lovely mask? <laughs> it's so tragic right now. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashlyn Sparrow. I am the assistant director for the Weston Game Lab. Um, I work really closely with Patrick on um, a lot of his game projects, and I will be uh, hosting you all today and moderating the chat. Um, so ask any questions. Please use that ask a question bar. And when it gets time to answering those questions, I will pull you up on screen. I'm glad that you love me because I love you too, Kel. OK, that's <laughs> that's all for me. OK. Um, so. Um, so yeah, um, just you know, put 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 a put a question, 
ask a question. Um, and um, also look at the previous questions, like um, both because your question might have already been asked and you have a chance to upvote questions. So like if it has been asked, just upvote that question. And we'll make sure that we see it if a bunch of people have it. Um, and um, uh, that's all, there'll be some more announcements, um, but I'm gonna save those for a bit. I wanna go back to the conversation. Um, okay, so um, one thing that, um, strikes me about this time period is like some people are lonely, right? Um, because we're not in the same space and we can't hang out with each other. Um, but other people have the opposite problem. Like we're stuck with our families. <laughs> our kids do not go to school. Um, you know, I am, I, I have here and I got the privilege of broadcasting from um, this classroom, which I have to tell you is if, if anyone out there was took Phil perspectives with me three years ago, I taught you in this classroom. It's, it looks so different right now. It's like covered in plastic sheeting, kind of sad, but still I'm happy. To, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a space that is not my house for the first time in three weeks. I'm kind of like alone for the first time in a pretty long time. So there's, there's these sort of twin problems of um, enforced solitude and enforced lack of solitude, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I, I almost feel like we complain no matter what, like the people who are alone are complaining and the people who are with their families are complaining. I'm like, why is everyone complaining? What is the thing that we want if neither solitude nor lack of solitude will make us happy? I mean, I don't have an amazingly wonderful philosophical or theoretical response to this, except to say that there's you know a lot of variation that I'm noticing between people who identify as introverts versus extroverts and all of this. And of course, like, it's not that introverts don't ever want to be around other people, they do in a variety of ways. I mean, I can say this as someone who's like fairly introverted. Um, and, and then of course, like, I mean, there's a distinction here to be made between also like aloneness and loneliness, right? I mean, mm -hmm. some of us are maybe relatively isolated, but because of all these network possibilities that we're either discovering or reconnecting with uh, for the first time in a while, uh, we might not feel entirely lonely um, within all of that. And of course, I mean, there's also just the element of like the disruption of everyday life that has nothing to do with technology um, in terms of like our habits being thrown off. And um, we already have a lot of habits that have to do with how we use social media, for instance, how we how regularly we post on social media, um, how regularly we use different digital technologies. So, so all those factors, I think, are uh, coming into play. So in my experience, people always say that they're introverts. What I mean is like people who I'm an extrovert. OK, uh, but no one ever says that they're an extrovert, like on Twitter, people talk, you know, why is that? Like, why is it that being an introvert is something to be proud of and like being an extrovert, you're not even supposed to say it? I have a very simple like answer to this, which is we're at the University of Chicago. I, I, don't, know if <laughs> we were, I, I don't know if we were at like Harvard or something that as many people would proudly identify as introverts. Um, I think that that's like a selection bias based on where we're at. OK, Ashlyn, can you make a poll? Um, if you get a chance to poll, are you an introvert or extrovert? I'm curious what our, what our group of people is going to say here. There are a bunch of polls, by the way, that you can do. Uh, um, um, okay, maybe that's it. Like on Twitter, too, I, people are always like saying that they're introverts. Uh, and I, I mean, I only, I've only very recently came out as an extrovert. Like I changed my Twitter profile to say extrovert like two weeks ago. And I'm like, I am accepting this about myself and I'm going to say it to people. But and it's because it should be the opposite, right? Extroverts should be walking around saying, hey, I'm an extrovert. Introverts should be like really shy about it and not even talking about how they're introverts, but it's kind of the opposite. I mean, I mean people in the chat are, right now are, are correctly pointing out that it's not just introversion and extroversion. There are all of these like subcategories. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all ambiverts. I mean, there are, you know, there are like various uh, subcategories to this as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not actually like a pure introvert, but I do, <laughs> I, I, I do get like, I've never shamed you. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, you you distinguish between sort of like loneliness and solitude, and like one one thing I read recently said something like loneliness is like unwanted solitude, right? And then I don't think I don't know that we have a name for the unwanted opposite, like me, like you know being stuck with my family every single day for, and I have like a big, there's six people in my house, right? So it's kind of in a small apartment. So a lot of us, um, you know, that's enforced sociality, right? Of a right. certain kind. So is the issue that like, we want to control, we want control over how social or how lonely we, how, sorry, how much we socialize that what we really value is control over that? 
I, I mean, again, the we in that, it's like, yeah, probably, although the we, again, um, like, I can identify with that, certainly. Like, I have various form, various control issues in terms of, like, uh, my own immediate space in relation to other people, perhaps. But I'm sure that there are people who are just as happy to, you know, be put in a situation with a huge crowd and access to strangers that they haven't met before. Like, when I, when I travel abroad or something like that, um, I'm not the kind of person who strikes up random conversations with people in a bar or something like that though I'm happy to engage with them if somebody else initiates it, right? So, so again, I think that comes down partially to personality and preference um, rather than like some broader category. Um, yeah. So, uh, so maybe just one more one more question on this topic and then, and then we'll move on. But um, I had a question about sort of community and community boundaries. So, um, you know, a bunch of people here are you Chicago people. Maybe like if you're a you Chicago person, can you just comment and say like what year you are? Right, so we see how many are you Chicago. So what do you see are you Chicago people? And you Night Owls was like you Chicago. It was for you, you Chicago people, and only you until now, right? And and when I was planning this, there were a bunch of people who said things like, look, maybe we should just keep this for you Chicago, uh, you know, and only open it to you Chicago people. Maybe you Chicago people will feel like something's been taken away from them because it's been now opened out to everybody. And I just had this very strong instinct that I'm not sure I could rationalize and be like, no, uh, this is, if we do this, we gotta do it for everybody. Um, but, you know, is there this sense of like, well, now the community has been like, because the community boundaries have been breached, there's less of a community. Um, is a community, does a community require you to exclude people? Is that like important for feeling the existence of a community? What do you think about that? Uh, not the kind of community that I want to see in the world, but I, I, but I think in most cases that that is true, right? Any category like citizenship or belonging to an institution in terms of being a student, faculty member, staff member, uh, administrator or something like that at, at a university obviously brings with it exclusions. And those are justified according to like various different means, right? Sometimes it's a bandwidth issue. It's like, I don't want to have too many people um, because things will crash or get unwieldy. Um, sometimes it's a matter of, uh, you know, this discourse of like controlling or modulating risk. Um, so the mm -hmm. idea that like, well, what if some trolls show up and start saying obscene things in the chat, which I'm not inviting unless you do that in a very creative way, uh, in which case I'd love to see it. Um, <laughs> but, but in, you know, I teach a lot of courses on like new media studies or digital media theory oh. and, um, trolling or, you know, like player killers and games or things like that. Like, like those kinds of identities come up a lot, right? Like people who enjoy um, producing chaos within organized social situations. Um, and oftentimes those people do so in harmful ways, right? Ways that are like racist or sexist or homophobic or stuff like that. Um, in other cases, those people just want, want to like poke the system a little bit um, and see what happens. Um, so I think I, I'm mainly just bringing that up because I think that's oftentimes cited as a reason why um, participants are controlled in particular ways. Mm. Um, like, like who gets included and who gets excluded or just uninvited. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, because that was cited to me. They're like, you're gonna get trolls. <laughs> and I, some part of me is like, I am a troll. <laughs> so <laughs> like I, I, you know, uh, uh, for our uh, one of our night owls, we read this paper last quarter, read this paper, um, anyone can be a troll. And I read it and it was kind of inspiring. It was like, yeah, I am also, I can be a troll. And, and I realized I can, like there, are, I have these impulses sometimes to destroy a kind of sense of accord that has built up in a group. Like everyone's agreed about something and it annoys me and I wanna break that up. So I have that impulse. Um, um, totally. There's a really great book by uh, Whitney Phillips called This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things. Um, that is like an ethnography of trolls in which like she spent many years interacting with trolls and doing interviews with them and stuff like that. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's so interesting, like people who are good at this or elect to do it, and we don't have good demographic data on this. Like it's probably mostly white men based on, you know, like available data. But again, like you, you, you never know for sure, but there, there's a, there's a dimension of like being unshameable that comes mm -hmm. with that, right? Because like, if you can go out and, and be invulnerable to any attack that comes your way, but then, try to undo someone else, um, you, you're a good troll. Another element of being a good troll has to do with having surprisingly very deep empathy, right? Because like in order to like undo someone else, you have to have a sense of like what their emotional landscape is like. So it's actually not that you're like 
nihilistic and incapable of um, understanding another person's emotional state. It's that you understand it so well that you can then um, cause effective chaos. Yeah, good. And like one function, it seems to me like people on social media really want to have emotions. Like they want it to be an emotional space. Um, and it may be that one function that those people play in the sort of ecosystem is that they make it possible to have emotions, right? As I feel like when we don't have emotions, we don't feel like anything, like we're really connecting. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's one way that the online space, like it kind of, almost like things need to be um, exaggerated or ramped up so that we can feel like, like on Twitter, there's just a the little face of me, you know, there's just like my little tiny face next to the words. And it's like, is that really even a human? Who knows, right? But when, when, when you have an emotional reaction to something I say, then I seem human. So like there's this, there's this kind of challenge of being human online, right? Where like when you meet someone and they have a physical body and like you're in a physical space, there's just this, it's like, we're just taking, we're just, we're just assuming the problem of other minds is solved. We're just taking it for granted. There's a human being, you know, but I feel like online, it's almost like there's this proof. You have to prove that you're human kind of over and over again. Um, and I feel like I'm doing that proof, like on Twitter, I'm like, I'm still human. I'm still human. Um, and the trolls, like, so the trolls are not necessarily something outside the system. They they, they play a part in that kind of um, yeah. mutual recognition system. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, like one distinction that gets thrown out sometimes in new media studies is that there used there used to be a time where, you know, like one of the key imperatives was know yourself, and we've moved from know yourself to express yourself mm. um, in, in social media. Um, and there, you're right, like emotion matters a great deal. And like emotion also in the sense of emoting, right? So like there are distinctions one can make between like feeling versus emotion versus affect. And emotion is the space not of like what is internal or what is shared necessarily. It's the expression of a feeling. Um, and so that expression becomes really important in platforms in which like you're using very minimal bits of text or GIFs or, right, or, or like very small moments of you know like and, and stuff like anger or laughter or really big emotions um will get more play will get more responses mm -hmm. and so eventually in order to uh, maintain a public and um have people who are uh producing reacts and likes to what it is that you're saying like some people start curating um you know a twitter feed or facebook or instagram uh that plays to big emotions too mm. okay maybe I'll pivot to our second topic. It's a totally different topic. Um, so this is something Patrick brought up in some of our exchanges that really interested me was the way in which the kind of um, quality or structure of attention has changed due to like the online world. And the distinction that he drew was between deep attention and hyper attention, right? So hyper attention is like what is happening right now to most of you because you're listening to what I'm saying and you're also chatting with each other and you're also reading the chat and maybe at the same time you're watching a movie and you know maybe you're doing one of the polls and like that's not how night owls usually works. Usually it's like people are sitting quietly. Okay, maybe some of them are looking at their phones but they're doing it surreptitiously and they're like watching us on stage, right? And that's more like deep attention. Um, so what do you see as like the trade-offs there with deep and hyper attention? Totally. So, so I think like, especially in the humanities, but arguably like any discipline or division in the university, like for a long time really promoted deep attention, right? So if I'm in an English course or a philosophy course and I'm doing a close reading of Toni Morrison or Kant or something, I need close attention, right? I, I need... Or, or I'm reading Heidegger or something, right? I need I need the close attention to be able to sit with an idea from sentence to sentence, to collate those in some ways, to stare at a book for several hours at a, at a time. And that requires a, a dimension of like discipline and patience and stuff like that. This is like a lot of what we teach in the traditional humanities. Um, but there came a time in which stuff like multitasking um, uh, became a bigger and bigger deal. And so so this other mode that you're describing of hyperattention, which uh, Catherine Hales and a few other people write about, um, became more important, right? So now we're in this interesting place where, you know, in my courses, I want to teach close attention, but I also want to teach smarter for forms of hyperattention. Mm -hmm. um, there was a really interesting um, paper that I read or kind of research study that came from Morgan Stanley a few years ago uh, that basically reported that 
um, particularly like people below the age of 40 or something are sometimes taking in four or five streams of information at the same time, right? And I can totally attest to this. Like I may be sitting on the couch playing um, a game on my Switch while I'm watching a television show, while I'm ambiently following something on social media. I don't, I don't do that all the time, but, um, but to be able to mediate multiple screens or multiple channels of information becomes a useful skill in the year 2020 in a way that it probably wasn't in like 1927 or something, right? Um, and so to teach people to like responsibly and effectively um, uh, be hyper attentive uh, is important. And you, and you see hyper attention coming up, you know, if you're an air traffic controller or if you're a video game player, you benefit from hyper attention more than you benefit from close attention. Yeah, good. And someone asked, what is hypertension? And as I understand it, it's just, um, you know, you're sort of um, switching quickly between different information streams, basically. Um, and so you're attending over a stretch of time to multiple information streams. Um, is that roughly right? Yes, that's right. Um, like, like I'm engaging in hypertension right now. I'm writing back to a comment, making a reading suggestion for someone while I'm paying attention to you and while I'm thinking about what I'm saying right now. Right, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> so do you also like it when you're teaching? Like, so I do not let you students use laptops in class, like even in like a lecture. Um, uh, Cause I'm like, and maybe that's like, because I'm kind of extrovert and like me a little bit narcissistic. And I'm like, I want you to pay attention to me. Hey, here I am, you know? Um, uh, so like, but do you like incorporate that into your te actual teaching where you're like, it's fine if you zone out and you're doing other things and that like, yeah, I, I feel very conflicted about this. I mean, I, I let people use laptops in, in all my courses. I tend to cut out phones because I feel like there, there is a specific form of distraction, at least that I have to my phone that is different from like the way I'm able to manage what's on my screen on a laptop. Um, and I do think, I mean, sometimes I try to incorporate hyper attention into certain exercises that we have. So I haven't done this for a number of years, but back when like, Second Life and virtual worlds were kind of a big thing. I used to do scavenger hunts inside Second Life that would teach people things about that specific platform and games in general. Um, and that was totally meant to be this kind of chaotic multitasking activity um, that nonetheless had learning objectives associated with it. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I always, I, I want people to think critically about what their own um, addictions and proclivities are, and I and I don't like the word addiction very much. I mean, yes, people can be addicted to games. Yes, people can be addicted to being online or on social media. But in fact, I think there are like levels of attachment that are not quite addiction that most of us have, or kinds of habits that we're not aware of. And I think as long as people are aware and are at some level making a choice in terms of how they're using, say, social media during my class or um, why they have multiple documents open at the same time, I, I find that okay, as long as there's a meta discourse going on about that. Can't people's meta discourses be bad? Yeah, 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 totally. And, and I, think, I think meta discourses don't even have to be like discourses in the traditional sense. Um, I mean, yeah, like, like, and it's hard for me to not allow people to multitask which is not even, about, I don't know why I keep using that word. I, 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 but yeah, something like that. When, okay, so for instance, um, like, okay, so what, when I teach about video games, we talk a lot about um, speed running. So people who play games very, very quickly and oftentimes try to beat world records on this stuff. And you watch some of these speed runners and they're able to like play a video game in a virtuosic way while they're reading a chat, very similar to the format that we have right now, but on Twitch. And they're able to give you these like amazing histories of the medium in real time, right? So there are ways of like thinking that don't afford with like how we used to think about thought and cognition as being kind of single screen, but that are like totally intelligent and interesting and, and novel and that we don't entirely yet understand. Good. But so all of this, everything you've said is from the point of view of the person taking in the information. But if, what if you are the information? Like right now, I'm the information. I'm producing the information. Right? And there are certain ways that we want to be taken in. Yeah. And certain forms of attention that we want to secure. Yeah. And I had this feeling like a big part of um, 
what makes this time period difficult for a lot of people is that there's a certain kind of attention that we value from people that we're not close to. So people that we're close to just kind of have to pay attention to us all the time. And like the fact that they pay attention to us isn't a sign of anything awesome about us, right? Like if our kids or our parents are, you know, are paying attention to us, it's like they're stuck with us, whatever. It's like, if your mom thinks you did something you did is great, like, you know, that's not gonna feel as impressive, right? As if some, so, so there's this kind of attention that we get from people, strangers or people that we're not close to where that's very validating. Like if yeah. people who I don't know listen to me, that's very validating for me. And that's true for a lot of people. And I wonder whether the mode of online attention, um, this kind of scattered mood, whether that fulfills people's need for that kind of validation. I think it changes what validation constitutes, right? So like you used the word uh, narcissism before, which like, told, I mean, I, I actually like, I have the same experience. And when I think about narcissism, I, I think about it not as like self-centeredness necessarily, but I think about it in like the, psychoanalytic sense of like feeling a certain vulnerability in terms of the relation that you're in at that moment. So like think about something like texting, right? Like um, texting now versus when it was first available on flip phones or something. Like the standard now is like I send a text and if I don't get an immediate response and that instant gratification or that dopamine hit that comes with like a gratifying response from one of my friends, like, you know, maybe I text someone else or, you know, you know so, so there's like, the speed at which we're getting feedback mm. also changes what like narcissism or performance or whatever, right, um, is, is in this moment as well. Um, it's not just speed. I mean, it's also like um, the quality of response that I get, how many ex 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 exclamation points it would have, for instance, right? Like I used to never write with exclamation points um, and then text introduces both that and emoji, for instance, because you don't have the facial cues that you have um, over Crowdcast or Twitch or Zoom or whatever, or face-to-face -face in person. And so you have to introduce these other elements um, that alleviate the forms of insecurity and vulnerability that come with any social relation. Yeah, good. Let me um, let me move over to games. Um, okay. Because I want to, uh, there's questions about gamification here and I want to make sure we get to talk about games. So first of all, I feel like there's two basic ways I have of thinking about games. One of them is like games are sort of rule governed activities. And the other is like games are like to be contrasted with like what is serious or what is real or what is work, right? And those yeah. are like two almost like conceptual spaces that the idea of a game exists in. Um, and um, I w so maybe I just want to hear something about how do you how do you think about games? What makes a game a game? Totally, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna throw out like, an an awesome definition, but I'll give you an example. So we were recently, we started talking about uh, Bernard Suits's work, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and his kind of like philosophy of, of what a game is. And one example that he gives um, has to do with golf, which is a game I've never played. I weirdly was a caddy when I was younger because there were good tips and it was like the best way to like make money over the summer, but I still don't understand anything about golf. But like the, the, the example of golf is like, if that game was simply about the objective of putting a small ball in, a, in 18 holes, you could walk up to that hole and just drop the ball right in. But in fact, it creates arbitrary rules and constraints, right? You have to use this weird club. You have to be at this distance. You have X number of moves to get to that. And those artificial constraints create like a flow state and create fun, right? Or create a, a capacity for playfulness and creativity that otherwise wouldn't exist. But I think, you know, games definitely have rules, they have mechanics, they have objectives, they have artificial constraints, they have players. So there are these like elements, um, uh, there's voluntariness, which is oftentimes a, a, an attribute of games that um, uh, Johann uh, Hoitzinger talks about, for instance, in his early writing about games. Um, so those are some of the <laughs> I never heard his name said, so now I'm, I'm taking that in. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, good. Oh, let me. Um, well, one thing you mentioned in suits, right? So suits um, said that you know games involve the overcoming of necessary obstacles, right? Um, and you were just talking about that with not putting the ball directly in the hole, but using this you know weird convoluted way, right? Um, it's kind of like um, what are those things called, like Rube Goldberg machines? In some way, every game is one of those, right? But so what's interesting is I did a poll on this 
And I ask people, do you think it's necessary that the game has like unnecessary obstacles? And does that have to be part of the game? And 70% of people said no, 77% of people said no. So maybe if you're one of those people who said games don't have to involve unnecessary obstacles, um, maybe like put your thing in the form of a question and be like, isn't this a counter example? Um, and then uh, and then you can go into the question and you can at some point in the Q&A raise your counter example to that. Because it seems pretty plausible to me that games tend to involve uh, some goal that you're achieving, like getting the ball in the hoop or something, but you're not allowed to do it in the regular way. you got to do it in the gamey way where that's like involved in the complicated thing that you've agreed to follow. Um, um, okay. And... Um, Oh, so, so, so there's a there's a good example that came out in the chat now, which is Minecraft, um, mm -hmm. which you know, uh, I guess many of us have played, and 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 young children still play all the time now, and that's interesting, right? Because that's like a sandbox space or virtual world that doesn't necessarily have objectives built into it. It does have rules, right? So there are there are arbitrary rules that have to do with like physics, right? You can't jump or move beyond a certain point. There are exploits that you can introduce that like change the rules in different ways. Um, but there still are artificial constraints even in Minecraft, I think, even though it's like open-ended in terms of you creating your own objectives or quests or things like that. Um, there's still constraints. I mean, I mean, anything that's open-ended and doesn't have constraints, I, I feel like uh, limits creativity counterintuitively, right? Like you don't have creativity, like if you just have an empty page, like that can be utterly disenabling mm -hmm. versus like if you have a series of rules, suddenly, you know, like um, the game of basketball where the rules change every few years, mm -hmm. um, even, even with it or any sport for that matter, right? But like in basketball, um, you know, like Michael Jordan was able to be Michael Jordan because of a lot of constraints and rules, right? Like it seemed like Michael Jordan was flying at the time if you were watching basketball before and, and during that, because like no one had done that with gravity slash like the rule set of basketball before. So there's a lot of creativity and virtuosity that can come from interpreting and understanding and inhabiting a series of constraints in a unique way. Good. Yeah. One thing I liked about um, Hoytinger, Hoyt um, his, his, his discussion of play is that he talks about how um, it's like a free activity that's, he says it's like it stands outside of ordinary life, but it absorbs the player completely. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, and he says something like it is surrounded by disguise and secrecy. Right. So the game is somehow protected from the outside world. And so maybe one reason why this hypothesis, why are these rules important? Why do they enable creativity? Why does, is that the sort of um, um, those rules are part of actually what insulate the game. They're part of the walls around the game, right? And that part of what makes the game feel so free is precisely that it isn't just part of real life. And if you have like just a white page that you're looking at, that page in some way bleeds into the room, right? You feel your physical, I'm sitting in this chair in front of a white page, I must write something. Like, whereas like, even even if you were if you were trying to like I, I write on graph paper a lot because I like the lines and like that they that the lines in a way absorb me in a certain way like I can fill some of them in I can make patterns right and that becomes like a game like I have these constraints so that maybe maybe part of what the rules do actually is insulate the game from the world outside. I think I think that's right. I mean, and so that's a really good example from Hoytinga. So so Ashlyn and I um, when we design games together we we oftentimes invoke this concept of magic circle that he uses, right? And he uses that term magic circle to describe a time and a space that is in some ways separated from everyday life, like you're describing, um, and where there's a different rule set. So one example that I often use in class when I'm, when I'm teaching about this is a uh, boxing ring. I don't, I don't watch boxing, but I've seen it from the corner of my eye a couple of times. And, and the, you know, the idea of like being in a ring, like, like that's a space and a time where you can like knock someone out and suddenly you get millions of dollars if you're at the right level of, you know, like in there's not Vegas bets being placed on this or whatever. Versus like if you knock someone out on the street, like you'll get arrested probably, right? Or feel guilty or something. And so like, like that basic act of hitting someone suddenly takes on a different kind of value and meaning within the magic circle of boxing than it does elsewhere. But there are like interesting exceptions to this. So like, as a designer um, working with Ashlyn Sparrow and Heidi Coleman and Kristen Schilt and a number of other people, um, 
we work on this this genre of alternate reality games, and these are games that explicitly don't announce themselves as games, right? Um, except for in rare cases, but for the most part, these are games that you um, fall into and have to kind of negotiate the status or the genre of what it is that you're doing. But you're never told like you know it's it's time for a basketball game or press start and start playing the Legend of Zelda. Um, mm-hmm. You just you fall into it. So there are these interesting artistic exceptions or, or limit cases that try to mess with the idea of a magic circle. Mm. Is that like a little bit like, say, um, I don't know, perf- like a kind of art where let's say like you're the theater, but but you're also performing in the, um, like a participatory theater, something like that. Um, um, uh, I mean, that is there, there's sort of art that does something similar to that. Um, uh, that breaks the boundary between the spectator and the, the work of art. Um, yeah, and, and I think games do this probably more than any other medium or any other form, right? Um, like there's, um, you know, uh, the, like Patrick Lemieux and Stephanie Bollock, uh, these two games researchers, and in fact, economists before them use this term metagame uh, to describe um, games that people play on top of games that they already have. So like the basic example of this would be different family rules for Monopoly, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Monopoly was like a terrible experience in my uh, household growing up. It would always lead to huge arguments and like people throwing over boards. So I actually have a very bad set of memories around Monopoly. But but in fact, like what happens when you round the corner, like you collect, um, you know, like a few hundred dollars or not when you round the corner or, or whatever, like there are these house rules. And that's a very basic example, but in any video game or board game or whatever, you find hundreds of metagames and variations speed running, which I mentioned before, right? Like um, any given video game doesn't necessarily have speed running built into it, but there are these communities that say like, okay, that's the game, but like, let's, let's create these other constraints. Let's say you have to play this game and not use a controller, but instead use like a running pad in order to complete it. Or let's say um, you can't use any weapons and you have to get through a first person shooter video game or wh- whatever the case might be. And with those constraints, we'll then time ourselves. Um, and I think that's true of every single game, right? There, There's not just like the game the form, there's also the game as a series of cultural practices, which are different at different historical periods with different communities. So this gets to something, there's a line, I think it's one of the opening lines in one of your papers that you sent me. Um, uh, uh, it's a quote from Gilles Deleuze and Philippe uh, Guattari. Um, you say, uh, they say, uh, but you quote, philosophy is the art of forming, inventing, and fabricating concepts. I thought that in- it's interesting. I mean, in, in a way, what you're saying right now is that there are sort of, um, there's the sort of concept of the game, and then there's, uh, the way I might have put it, is like there's almost like the conception of it that is the, the particular token playing or something like that. But the question I want to ask you is like, why is it good to have more concepts? Like why why do we want to embed more concepts? Um, um, why, for instance, is it good that each, fa- like, suppose each family does have their own way of playing Monopoly. Um, why is that kind of increase, you know, that kind of um, like, let's say diversification of the concept space or something, what's good about that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think in a general, way, I don't know if this is a question you're asking, but like why concepts are good. Like when I come, you know, like I work more now in critical theory than I do in analytic philosophy, but there are, there are all of these connections between these two ways of thinking. And, and, and so like when I have to define something like theory, I oftentimes like default to either um, this definition from, from Gautry Spivak that is theory is provisional generalization. So you're, you're like, you're trying to create order and generalizations, but in a provisional way that can change as you move forward, or theory is sometimes like philosophy that is aware of its own rhetoric and articulation beyond the ideas being expressed, right? So it's like philosophy with a literariness, which of course a lot of philosophy has, right? I mean, like Deleuze is a philosopher, but is like incredibly literary in the way that that that, that he writes, or Nietzsche or something like that, um, I think uh, falls in that category as well. Um, but in terms of like why you know, why you would want to have variations on a game. I, th- I think one reason for it is that the most basic way of playing a game is playing it exactly in the way the designer tells you to play it. But when, when I play Super Mario Brothers or whatever, I mean, I'm just taking a very generic example here. 
um, in order to win Super Mario Brothers or Super Mario Brothers Odyssey, I have to reverse engineer the algorithm that the designer produced. So I'm basically like entering into a brain space with the designer and reverse engineering that algorithm they created. And that's fun and interesting, but also limiting. But if, but if I then go into that space and decide like, um, I have to beat Super Mario Brothers without jumping or something like that, which isn't actually possible, um, or without a certain button, um, then I'm provisionally becoming a game designer. And so rather than simply being a kind of consumer or even a player, I suddenly, at least for a few minutes or a few seconds, enter the space of, of being a designer. And I actually think that's, that's a really amazing creative space and learning space to learn how to make a system, not just inhabit a system. Good. So this gets to something that I had a, a theory that I had about video games, which is like, I know almost nothing about video games, but um, just sort of exploring the space a little bit through, you know, um, stuff you sent me um, over the past week. I had this thought that maybe something that's characteristic of a lot of video games, if you think of games as rule governed activities, is that in a video game, you don't know the rules. That is, you know, some of them, right? But the yeah. idea that you have to reverse engineer the algorithm is essentially you're learning the rule of the game by playing the game. And so you didn't know that if you jumped, like in Mario Brothers, like you jump up in one space and it turns out that there's like a thing there that you can hit and a coin comes out, right? But you didn't know that because it would just look like air, right? Yeah. And so in, you explore the space and essentially you're learning the rules, which is not at all how chess works, right? It's not how Monopoly works. You, you read the rules and then maybe you have the family decisions about the rules, but you're not learning the rules as you play the game. Right, and it seems to me that it's it's characteristic of video games actually that you are doing that, and I, I wonder mean, if that's one thing that people might like. Yeah, I mean that's super interesting. So, so like for instance, like let's take chess just as a basic example. Like, and this would actually what I'm about to say will probably describe me. I'm not a very good chess player, but mm -hmm. like one could know the rules of chess. Like I understand the basic like the way that the board is composed, how pieces move, right? So like in that way, I could read a series of rules. And, and be able to play chess. And yet there's all this stuff about tactics and strategy and how a game unfolds that you don't really know until you've played the game of chess for like a decade or something like that. And I think there, there is a similarity with video games too, where like maybe the rules for a platformer video game or a first person shooter or real time strategy game aren't given up front in the same way they would be with a board game. But if I've played video games for a long uh, part of my life, I have an intuitive understanding of genre conventions and what is expected of me in some ways that may make me internalize a rule set much more quickly. And there are really clever games that basically say like, okay, we know you're going to assume what, are, what a role playing game is and we're going to like lean into that. So Undertale is an example of a game that does this, that like um, leans into the assumptions that in a role playing game, you kill enemies. Uh, but in fact, you start killing enemies and it turns out like, you actually have the choice of being nonviolent. You just mm -hmm. default it to a certain mm -hmm. genre. There, there are ways of playing with expectations and constraints, if not always rules, um, in all of the. In all, but I, I think all of these cases. Mm, right. So, like, because um, it, it seems to me like in a lot of games, like say, or, you know, take a game like tennis or something. Right. There, there are these. Ch the games poses pose challenges. They can pose physical challenges, um, etc. That that don't necessarily have anything to do with learning the rules or learning the rule space or anything like that, right? And right. yet it, it it seems distinctive of video games that there are these, there could be like secrets, it's sort of what I mean. A lot of video games have secrets, right? That you unlock or discover, right? And that is a way of saying that there are these rule spaces um, that you didn't know about. Um, That's a really, I mean, I mean one, one question that I would ask you back, right? It's mm -hmm. like, do you think like in tennis is, is gravity a rule, right? No. I mean, I mean, I don't okay. think so. I don't think so. Yeah. And like, I mean, it's also the rule rule in video game is a funny thing, right? Because I think it's kind of essential to the rules of games that you can break them. And so like, I, I thought this, so this is an interesting, this is why I framed it in terms of the rule govern versus the fake. I think that um, those two different, I grew up thinking of games fundamentally as things that are fake, not things that are rule governed. So I grew up learning to cheat at games. I cheated, I always cheated at every game I ever played growing up. I learned to cheat at the same time as I learned to play. And I didn't, I didn't know this was weird until I got to college at the University of Chicago. And I was an undergrad, it was my first year and I was like playing games with people and I was always winning. And 
they're like, at some point, I can't remember how exactly it came up, but someone's like, is, well, you're always winning. I'm like, yeah, well, you guys are like, terrible at cheating. And they were like, you were cheating? And all of a sudden it was like this, this flip, like this gestalt shift yeah. happened in the room where everyone saw me as evil. They're like, you're just a bad person. You cheat at games, you know? Well, oh, you know, now we know that you're- I don't think so. I mean, I actually think like, like, as a game designer, I kind of love cheaters because, like, so, so there's a distinction that, that I Can think, you cheat in video games? Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, no, no, of course. I mean, like, um, there are, you can know things about the software, like exploits or things like that, that weren't supposed to be the case, but are, and you can use those in a variety of ways to shape time up in the game or whatever. And, and sometimes you can cheat in multiplayer games. Um, mm. but, but I think, so, like, I think it's Bernard Suits and other people bring this up as well. There's um, there's these two figures that loom large in game studies, the cheater and the spoil sport. Mm. And like, I, I actually like cheaters. I don't like spoil sports. So cheater, the reason I like cheaters is because they care about the game, right? They care about the game so much that they want to like break the rules and they care about winning maybe or exploring the game in unique ways so much that they're willing to bend the rules, but, but, they, but they still care. Whereas a spoil sport is someone who comes in and says, like, I'm not going to take this seriously. This is just a game. It's nothing more than a game. This is serious. And that breaks the magic circle, right? That breaks the social contract that we have about, like, we're going to play pretend or we're going to enter into this fictional scenario. Of course, we know that it's not real, but it might become kind of real if we take it seriously. And if this person's standing over here and being like, this is stupid, um, I mean that, and that's what a troll is more likely to do, right? A troll is not going to ch cheat. A troll is going to be a spoil sport and try to break the the contract. Cool. Okay. Um, so um, let me let me ask you about empathy in video games. Um, so um, you, one of your papers talked about these video games that, in some sense, like put you in the shoes of somebody whose life is filled with a kind of suffering that you're not familiar with. So one example is like somebody who has a kind of minimum wage job and is having to make these really tough choices about like, do I spend all this money on health insurance and then I might have money for my rent and then do I pick up the phone with the bill collector, right? And so the idea is that playing this game will sort of give you some sense of um, what it's like to live that kind of life. And so one question I had for you is like, is, is that what it does? Or like, is there possibly something questionable about psychological tourism? You could think of it that way too, right? Of like, oh yeah, now I know what it's like to suffer because I've kind of played at suffering. Like is suffering something that we ought to play at? And yeah, so that's just a question for you. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it's one that people have different kinds of responses to based on their subject position and histories and stuff like that. But it's a big, it's a big debate in, um, in digital media and in games, right? So like when video games first started moving from being something that you did in arcades or that like, you know, like adolescent white boys did in their basements in like the nineties or the two thousands to this like massive art form um, that billions of people play, there was a question of like, wait, like, games seem more interactive than film or television or whatever and make you more involved in the world, which I think is, you know, true in a lot of ways. Um, but if that's the case, couldn't we make games that make people like really understand someone else's experience? And I think your, your example of the spent game and, and stuff like that is a really good example. Um, I mean, another example would be um, Anna, Anna Anthropy, who's a game designer at DePaul uh, now. Uh, she made a game a number of years ago called Dysphoria, which was, um, about her experience of being trans. And um, and it's a game that got a lot of attention and, and is a great game in addition to her, like hundreds of other games that she's made. But this was one in which um, she didn't want this to be an empathy game. She basically said like, look, this is an autobiographical description of my own experience. It's not me meant to make you empathize. In, in fact, you couldn't empathize after playing a five minute game. Like it is largely tour, like, um, um, this, this form of tourism that you're describing. And, and I think that's, that's largely true. It's not that games can't um, add to the capacity to be empathetic in some ways, but I think um, too much pressure is put on games to do that when, when in most cases they just can't, especially not 
educational games or what people sometimes call serious games. Um, My husband showed me this game um, called Papers, Please. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. Um, I was describing the game to him. He's like, here's the other end of the spectrum. It's you're, you play a border control agent in an oppressive regime, basically. And you're sort of examining people's papers and deciding whether or not, I can't remember whether or not they get to leave or enter, right? But he said, you know, when you start playing this game at first, you feel empathetic with the yeah. people and you're like, oh no, this person might really, but like, as you play it over and over, you become numbed to their, like, you become suspicious and you really come to inhabit the point of view of a border control agent who like, um, you know, is just trying to do these things as quickly as possible and ignore the humanity of the people. And I was like, so, you know, is that like, like, what do we say about the ethics of that form of tourism? Um, I don't know if you had thought yeah. about that. Yeah, and Papers, Plays, this uh, Lucas Pope game is a really great example because um, like a lot of games basically have these like binary morality systems, right? Where you can you can be the bad guy or you can be like a, like a good character in some ways and the choices that you make like slide you across that scale. So the Fallout games, for instance, for people who play games um, are an example of that. Papers, Please is really smart because it, do it, it doesn't just say like you can be this or that. It actually has all of these different layers of, um, like I think of it more as an ethics game than a morality game. Um, it doesn't have like an absolute as binary kind of like top down schema. It's more like as a border agent, I can look out for my own family or these people coming in. I can um, treat a person as a freedom fighter or a terrorist. I can, like, there are all these like micro uh, ethical decisions that end up adding up to like how you play uh, the broader game. And there are elements of, of empathy, right? Do you empathize with this particular person in front of you or not? But, th but there, it's not a matter of like empathy or not empathy. It's like, you know, you have limited resources and your character is constantly uh, being threatened. Like you have comparative empathies that you have to um, uh, mediate between. And so it ends up being a lot more like everyday life than it is um, a kind of uh, constrained uh, minimalistic game experience. Okay, good. I have one more question, one more video game. I have tons more questions, but we, uh, I, I want to move to the Q&A part, but one more video game question. And then, but I want to remind you guys, like, look, there are 39 questions right now. Feel free to add. Also, feel free to upvote and stuff, because we're going to be moving to the Q&A part. Um, um, and then before we actually get to the questions, there's going to be some, a few more announcements. Okay. Um, the question I want to ask for you, I want to ask you is, video games, guilt. So I think playing video games makes people feel guilty. Um, and some people like, okay, my husband, like he doesn't feel guilty, but I try to make him feel guilty about it. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you really be playing a video game right now, right? Um, I'm like, at least he's been playing this game called Subnautica. I don't know if you know it, my, but I'm like, it's okay if you play it while the kids are watching, at least then you're entertaining them. But like, otherwise, right? So I'm, I'm very moralistic about it. And I like, and I haven't played them since I was like a long time ago. Why do people moralize? Why do people like me moralize video games? Why do people feel guilty about playing them in a way that's more so than other kinds of games, I think? Yeah. I, I love that we're talking about guilt, not only because like I was Catholic when I was younger and so guilt loomed large over my life, but also because I feel like the guilt versus shame distinction um, was uh, such a big part of my, my life as a philosophy major when I was an undergraduate. Um, <laughs> So, so it's, it's nice to be returned to that in some way. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I think part of it, part of it is um, the, the history of video games, right? So um, there are associations between video games and gambling, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. That go back a really long way. And some of those are really legitimate. Like for people um, in the chat, for instance, like the loot boxes that you encounter in, in freemium games, for instance, or something like that. Like there are actual modes of, of gambling built into games. But another element of this is, you know, like, like video games in particular came out of the military industrial complex. Like when you look at the earliest examples of games from the 50s and 60s prior to the arcades, these are all being made on machines like at MIT or the University of Utah um, that are being used as, as part of the military industrial complex in the US and are serving military projects and a lot of those early games like space war like are shooters and a lot of the games like you know like grand theft auto or um first person shooters that we hear about all the time um are also violent in in some way or another and there were these like congressional hearings in the 90s around mortal Kombat. um and so there's this history of blaming everything 
on video games, right? I mean, even, whenever there's a school shooting, whenever there's um, there's a shooting, as there often is in the United States, um, the first place that people go is like, well, it must be people playing video games. But then you look at all of these graphs of like the top 10 countries where people play video games and the top 10 countries where uh, where gun violence happens. And like the only place where those intersect is in the United States, right? And there are like plenty of other countries where people play violent video games and there are almost no violent crimes. And yet that association continues. The last thing that I'll say is um, to tie this back to our earlier conversation, um, there is a weird stereotype that people who play games are antisocial. And I remember like growing up with this and always being confused by it. Like I would always play games with other people. Like even when I played single player games, I would be on a couch with a bunch of my friends and we would usually trade off the controller um, with one another. Or if I was online, I would be playing with other people and communicating with them yeah. via text and voice. I think playing video games is like the most social activity. And yet there's this, um, social stereotype of gamers as loners, um, as introverts, as um, as people who are actually like you know violently opposed to sociality in some ways. So I think I think th there's just this like multi-decade baggage that goes with playing video games, um, which has changed, right? I mean, video games went from uh, a, a very small kind of in-group activity to, to there currently being about 2.6 billion people who play digital games worldwide um and that and that that switch over right came with a variety of growing pains so like the gamergate um uh crisis or scandal or whatever that happened around 2014 right that was that was like a, a case of this it was basically a bunch of like um white men who understood gaming to be this very narrow space of like shooting at people um in first person shooters or very quickly moving through a real-time strategy game saying like hey, all these art games and indie games and serious games and queer games that are suddenly becoming part of the ecology, we don't want that. That's not even a game. Um, and that didn't go so well for them, I think, overall. I mean, it was a complicated multi-year process, but um, that's an example of, um, uh, of that boundary being kind of negotiated and debated. There's one word that you used earlier. You used it and you're like, I'm not gonna use it, that I think is relevant here, which is addiction. Yeah. So I think right. that's part of part of what um, the the negative valence that's attached to video games is the feeling like some like a lot of the time people are playing them even though they judge that all things considered they should be. Do you think that that's more true of video games than other forms of entertainment? Um. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I was just writing about this um, in uh, for an essay that I've been working on um, uh, for a while. Like the WHO, right, um, like categorized gaming addiction as a thing about a year ago, the World mm -hmm. Health Organization. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so, so it actually became a kind of um, a condition that one could have that, you know, like, um, uh, anyway, but, a year later, like we find ourselves in the COVID-19 situation and within the pandemic and the World Health Organization, almost a year after making that pronouncement, tweeted that people should be playing video games with one another instead of going outside. Right. So like that just shows you the level of confusion there is about what a video game is. It became healthy. Them, right. It would have been like nothing to do because it's like the best way to stay social all of a sudden. Um, and I, I at once, I feel annoyed, but I also feel like validated where it's like, oh, like a life of being criticized for engaging in like immoral, whatever, yeah. like <laughs> guilt-ridden activity suddenly has become like the way of staying healthy. Um, right, right, yeah. cool. Okay, I wanna just make a quick like announcement about our contest. So we had a writing contest, an essay contest for today, and we had some awesome essays. We had three winners. Um, I'm just gonna announce the winners now. Um, so our, our two um, runners up were um, Rhina Weinstein, who wrote an essay called On Social Virtues in a World Without Coincidence, and Theo Belchi, 
uh, uh, a crisis of space. And our winner was Adora Svitak, um, Closeness Without Consequences. And all those people will be getting Night Owls t-shirts and Adora, and uh, the, 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 the essays are in fact already on the blog, which you can see down below the screen. So if you want to read them. Uh, and in fact, Adora's piece is going to be published in the Point Magazine as well. So congratulations to all of them and to all of you um, per participate in our next contest, which is already ongoing and the deadline is on Wednesday and it's on the end of the world. And for this one, you can still write an essay, but you can also write a poem or a short story. Okay, so you have a lot of options. Um, if you write a poem, we said 800 words, it can be shorter than that if it's a poem. Um, uh, and the other thing is just next week's, uh, I didn't, I wanted to, you know, next week's Night Owls is on the end of the world. That's why the contest is about the end of the world. Patrick, you had an announcement. I did, I did, I did have one announcement. So um, for everybody who's who's um, coming into this is in the chat, um, as I said before, I often work with Ashlyn Sparrow and a bunch of other people on these things called alternate reality games. Um, we're part of a group called the Forecasters. Um, and we've just released a new game a few days ago, which we're being a little bit more overt about. Um, uh, there was a kind of rabbit hole away into the game um, that a number of you participated in. Um, we had um, about, I think, 3,300 people come through that rabbit hole. Um, but now, between now and Monday at 5 p.m., uh, we're opening up um, team formation. So if you're interested in playing a game ambiently for the next few weeks online, with teams, think of it as a mix of like a transmedia narrative and scav and the uncommon app and online sociality and all the stuff we're talking about now. Um, if you're interested in signing up for a team, which can be five people, 25 people, anywhere in that range, I'm sending a link now. Um, you can also go to forecastlab.com and there's a link that will take you specifically to this sublink. We'd love to see um, a bunch of people participate because the game will be only as good as the participants and the um, discovery that happens. And we promise we have a lot of weird things that we're going to reveal over the next few weeks. So we hope um, a bunch of you can uh, be involved. Cool. Okay. So Ashlyn, can you um, bring someone up for the Q and A? We're going to go till eight o'clock. So we have like almost two hours for questions. Um, I am currently inviting uh, Ryan Hathaway okay. to the screen. Yeah, and when Ashlyn invites you, if you don't feel like going on the screen, you can just decline. You don't even if you ask a question, you don't you don't have to join us. We'll just move on to the next person. So. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it does. Yeah, it'll take a minute, but um, that the lag will be gone after the first one. So. Oh, is it, uh, Patrick, is it limited to current U Chicago students? Yeah, so um, we're, we're trying, so both undergraduates and graduate students can participate and also alums, um, staff, faculty, I mean, really anybody associated with the university. We're, 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 keeping, we're staying pretty liberal in terms of like who we're bringing in. Um, so, you know, like everything I guess has its limits, but um, yeah, but we're still trying to be inclusive within the large umbrella of people who are University of Chicago affiliated, past, present, and future. Admitted students, absolutely. Um, would love to have admitted students like start their U Chicago experience by playing a weird game with us online. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Well, maybe um, just while we're waiting for, yeah. um, uh, there's a question we wanted to talk about and we hadn't, um, uh, which is, um, could life be a game? What do you think? Could life be a game? Yeah, no, it's a really great question. Um, we, we started talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because this, this this question of like, is life a game, even if you don't know it's a game, um, comes up in a lot of movies, especially from like mm -hmm. the 90s, 2000s, mm -hmm. right? So the most famous example would be like The Matrix, yeah. right? I mean, like, like you're in The Matrix, The Matrix is a virtual world, but you don't know that you're in it. or a more extreme example would be The Truman Show, where um, Jim Carrey's character is in a reality TV show, but he just thinks that it's life. He was born into this. Um, but in fact, there's an audience, and it is a game that is rule-structured and space-bound and stuff like that. And I think we, we have countless examples of those kinds of 
movies and television shows because it's or like Elon Musk recently said he was convinced that we actually live in a version of the Matrix. Um, and this is a philosophical question that comes up in, in various forms. Um, I think, you know, for me, thinking about this historically, um, I think the question of like, is life a game would have felt very differently in the 1930s than it does in the 2020s, for instance, right? Games have, sat have become saturated in culture in our time in a way that they weren't back then. Of course, you had Go, you had chess, you had card games, um, but these were like a subset of hobbies versus now um, gamification, video games, board games are everywhere, right? They've become a kind of cultural literacy that it's almost difficult to evade. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example of this, which is um, the current presidential election, right? Like, is that a game? I mean, in one way, it obviously is. It's a competitive contest that like one person wins, like one person becomes the US president. In another way, many of us would say, absolutely not a game. It's the most serious thing ever. And when you call something a game, you treat it as, as being frivolous or being unserious in some way. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's another level of this where you think about like how uh, presidential elections are mediated. And when I watch, like when I'm at the gym or something, which I'm not allowed to do anymore, but, um, and I see ESPN on the screen, on one screen and election coverage on the other screen, they're almost identical in terms of like how people treat an NBA game and treat uh, the presidential election in terms of like commentary and, and all of this kind of stuff. So there, are, there are many ways that I think you can you can think of even an election as being a game. And I I take games very seriously, right? I mean, I, I don't, when I call something a game, I'm not demoting it. I'm actually saying that there's like um, a level of experiential intensity and, um, and rule boundedness and thought that comes with that thing that's very deliberate and very enabling. And so like, I would say, you can say, you can argue either that life is a game or that life can be a game or life can be like a game for some people, right? I mean, these are different kinds of statements that you can make about it, um, but they seem possible, yeah. Good, so one thing that um, Benny is asking in the comments is like, don't we play games to simulate life and not vice versa? Um, oh, here, let's let's go on to our question. We'll come back to this. Yeah, hey. Hi. So when uh, you come on, just say your name and then say your question. Uh, my name is Brandon Murphy. My question was, <clears throat> is there such a thing as digital intimacy? Where do the elements of risk and spontaneity reside in the digital realm? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I would say for me, um, I would expand this and say like digital and networked intimacy, right? Um, I mean, abso absolutely, right? I mean, I mean, there are forms of like friendship and romance and sexuality that happen entirely online um, where there is like, never a, a physical like touch component to it. I mean, there is a touch component, which is like, I'm touching like, you know, the keyboard and I'm touching my mouse. And, and there is a, a form of like somatic connection um, even there in some ways. Um, but yeah, you know, like, I mean, like there are times like back in the day there were pen pals, I guess. I never had a pen pal, but that would be a way of having like, like a relationship at a distance that was mediated by letters that you would send back and forth. Um, now you could go into a chat room or a virtual world and like form an immensely rich, complex friendship or relationship with someone um, that you can maintain over weeks or months or years in some cases. Yeah, it strikes me that some of us are sort of almost like guarded about parts of ourselves in um, many contexts that we encounter and we can let that guard down in um, digital context some, sometimes. So even though, so there are forms of intimacy, like there are kind of people with whom I just have email relationships, right? Where it becomes weirdly easy to like reveal a lot immediately and, and to reveal a lot about my emotional state, like immediately without thinking to such a person. Um, um, because precisely because a lot of the other things that might've held me back are not in place. Right. So but it's a it's a funny form of intimacy, like it like I'm sort of guaranteed that it's not intimate in one way hmm. and that makes it possible to be intimate in another, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like also like I guess how you define intimacy in all of this. I mean, for, for me, 
like like the difference between I don't know like pleasure and intimacy or something with with another person is like with intimacy you're taking you're taking a risk right I mean I mean you're taking more of a risk you're like opening up your boundaries and becoming more or less vulnerable to another person which you can do on email which you can do on Skype which you can do on on text um, even if you're not there physically there are obviously other risks and opportunities that come with being like fully physically present with another person. Uh, but there are plenty um, of these kinds of like negotiations of intimacy um, that come in this format or in similar formats to it. Yeah, I um, would say like the biggest thing that makes the digital thing safe, feel very safe is like that you can like literally shut the person down. Like you can, like I used to joke with like my husband about how like kids should come with a switch where you could just turn them off at night. Right. It's like, cause getting your kid to go to bed is really, it's like a really big challenge. Right. When they're, you know, little, even when they're older. Right. And it's like the kids would just be so much easier if you could just shut them off. And then in the morning you turn them back on. Right. And it's like, um, that's, you know, but of course that's just kids. It's like everybody in your life. If only you could just turn them off and then turn them on. But that's what it's like to have a digital relationship is that you get to turn the person off and on. And I feel like that's an incredible amount of power. Um, to have, and so it makes a lot of stuff feel very safe. Like that's my experience of it. Yeah, th th there's an interesting comment that came up just as you were saying that. To like to add, uh, Jay Benson said something about ghosting, right? Yeah. I mean, like, like it's not yeah. like ghosting didn't exist prior to the internet. Like, like people could just like take up and and leave and not explain um, just as easily there, or not just as easily, but they could also do it there. Now, like to ghost is super easy. You just block someone. Um, in your game or via text or wherever, and you're suddenly unreachable and you don't have to do anything about it. Um, and there are, you know, there are like other things like ghosting as well. Um, yeah, so Ashlyn, can we try to have the next person um, uh, uh, be lined up in that way? Um, uh, just so we can switch more quickly. Um, um, like the next um, question. Yeah. Um, As we're doing that, somebody made a follow-up comment about ghosting, saying yeah. that people can still hold grudges. So that, that that's a really important point, right? There's a continuity with anything. Like again, if I create a completely anonymous character in a virtual world and I go around having romantic or sexual relationships with people, like yes, I can ghost them. I can sign off at any given moment. But if I'm still a part of that permanent world, there are reputational costs and there are emotional costs, right? I mean, so even like. People want to say that virtual experiences are not real, but emotionally they are or can be real. Right. Okay. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. No, I was just struck by that distinction I wanted to be made at the beginning about being alone versus being lonely. Um, and I was, you know, reflecting on how it probably took me a week or two to, to sort of enjoy being alone again. I, I sort of, I, been realizing that my life before now is like work is where life is and home is where you know uh, being lonely is. But but you know then I, I I thought I was just recovering something about myself when I was enjoying being alone. But listening to you, I wondered if it was more that I thought everyone else no longer had a life, and so I didn't feel so so, so bad about it. <laughs> Anyway, That's actually a great point that there's this kind of, all the FOMO that we had is gone, right? <laughs> That's a great point. And like there was there's this erasure of FOMO. They're like, oh, this I always used to feel, especially when I like I grew up in uh, New York City, and I always had this feeling that like the exciting stuff was happening somewhere else. Just one of my you know, I, and I still feel that when I'm there, especially in New York City, less so in Chicago, but um, there's all, all this stuff happening inside of places and I'm shut out of it. And now it's like, nothing's happening. So you don't have to feel like you're shut out of stuff. Um, I like, does, I, I haven't actually experienced that as a form of relief. Have you, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, uh, not, not, not directly, but the, the thing that I was thinking about through all of this is like, part of what is like maybe so jarring about going, like for me, like, being in a meeting every hour of my life to like being at home and still being in meetings, but not in quite the same way is like what was jarring about that isn't going from being around people to not being around people. It's about like all of my habits being pulled out from under me. Like mm -hmm. when I get up early in the morning, I like to leave the house immediately and grab a coffee and sit by myself. And now I can't, I like, 
have to make coffee here and and you know um and, and it's a different kind of dynamic and and the thing about habits though right it, it's not just a moment of realizing like oh i had all these habits that i didn't know and a lot of them were bad um it's also realizing like how creative habits are right like whenever you form a, a discipline or form a habit, you're also like becoming a, a different kind of person. You're, you're taking on um, certain forms of safety and continuity within which you can riff and actually become more creative, right? I mean, this is like, when I think about improvisation, for instance, like improvisation is not doing anything, right? If you're like a great jazz musician or a martial artist or a video game improviser, you actually know the rules and have these habits more than anybody else does. That's that's why you can like innovate within those, those habits. So I think like for me, like I did feel that jarring movement into like a different form of aloneness. But for me, I think that index a change in habits more than anything. Cool. Ashley, you're gonna read someone else's question. Right? I am gonna read someone else's question. I'm gonna read Orion Hathaway's question. I, I, love, I love the owl face. I'm gonna just, I, you know, I, I just, Snapchat I'm just going to keep it going. Yeah. Do you feel like the classroom setting is normally controlled by extroverts? Does moving online for an extended period of time give introverts a platform to be more comfortable sharing their ideas? That's a great Ooh, that's, question. That's a really good question. Um, so let me say one thing. I was talking to my colleagues today, and I'm not teaching online um, right now because uh, I'm on leave this year. Uh, so Patrick, are you teaching online? I'm not this this quarter, but I've done similar things to this before. Yeah. I've I've taught online before, actually. Yeah. Um, but um, what my colleague said was, he's like, the class feels really weird. Um, at, well, everyone seems weirded out um, by, and and he's like, I don't think it's coronavirus. I think it's the online setting. And he's like, it's a lot lower energy, um, and people are not um responding to one another at all like they just respond to me right so he has maybe like a 30 person class it's on zoom right so there i think like um I, what he was sort of saying is like it's just less of a um a, there's less personality in the room um than there was otherwise now if introverted people are the people who express their personality less then they might they might um experience that less um i'm pretty because i'm extroverted and I was like the person who had their hand up like every single minute of every class. I'm pretty attuned to this and actually kind of hyper attuned to making sure that people don't dominate. Like, cause you know how you're the most suspicious of people who are like you, right? That's what I'm like. And so um, I am very um, uh, like, uh, I really go out of my way to draw out the people who might not um, want to speak. I want them to, I view it as a triumph if I can get them to speak. So, um, so uh, like, um, I guess I don't, and I'm grateful to the extroverts too, because like a lot of the time you kind of need them. So I feel like it's a nice balance actually having those people, that, that's my experience. But Patrick, you have thought about that? And we'll get to your question in a minute. Yeah, I mean, to add really briefly, like in a lot of courses that I teach, um, I try to have like different forums for different kinds of interactions so that I don't have to penalize few people for just like not participating or something, right? I mean, there's in-class participation, there's like writing on a blog or Slack or something like that. There's, you know, like asynchronous form of communication that online platforms make a lot easier, right? Because if you, if you have a blog with comments or a Slack where people can uh, post things whenever they want. Can you um, hear even me? <laughs> yes. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of how I mm -hmm. try to handle that. Um, right, right, right. So you have a lot of like different spaces um, essentially. Okay, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Now introduce yourself. Yeah. Your okay, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I've just been sitting here looking weird. I can't hear no, no, or no. see no, anyone. No, that's a good idea. So I'm sorry if I'm talking over anyone. Yeah. Um, but a lot of what my question was based on was that I've been hearing a lot about um, different surveillance technologies that in particular universities are using to um, proctor students, there are things where like you have to take your camera and move it around the room to show that there's no one else there with you. You mm -hmm. have to turn on a microphone so that people can listen to you. And this is really reminiscent of games for me because we already have um, in games, there's a lot of moderation in online games. Um, and these things that are thinking about like when we're in these anonymous disconnected conditions, how we um 
how we regulate people and how we control people's instincts to be chaotic and to do things that are kind of against the rules. Um, so this is something I was wondering about in terms of our current situation where a lot of our life has been expanded. That's it. Yeah. Good question, Patrick. Um, I, I mean, the, the surveillance part of it is like one part of the question, right? And there have been a lot of debates about um, how much surveillance Zoom allows for, for instance, right? Um, and the, the level of uh, setting changes that have to happen uh, to minimize those possibilities for surveillance. That, of course, is part of a larger set of debates around like what happens to any of our data when we post on um, social media or make our profiles available or, or, or things like that. And that obviously extends to the classroom in a variety of ways. Um, I mean, part of your question too, I think another part speaks to the to like um, uh, the kind of moderation that maybe happens both in a classroom and in a game. Um, and, um, and it's interesting, I, I think when you move from physical space to being online, um, if I'm with a group of people and overseeing a conversation or teaching, I'm less likely to be in like professor mode where I'm professing or lecturing or whatever. Um, and more likely to be more like a moderator where, where I'm like a DM in a Dun Dungeons and Dragons game or something, right? Where you're um, moving around the pieces and foregrounding questions and, um, and curating the conversation. Uh, that doesn't speak to the surveillance part of your question, but I think there are different modes of pedagogy that this format allows. What, what do you think, Agnes? Yeah, I, so I'll get to your question in a sec, but I want to, I just want to, I, I really like this question. So um, I, I, one of my colleagues actually sent around like a bunch of rules that he was going to have for his students. And it made sense to me, you know, like don't eat during class because you wouldn't do that in a regular class. But like in a regular class, you don't need to say it, right? And there's like, um, like, so there's this kind of policing that's in a way having to happen because we're having to create class, right? And like, I, um, you know, I've been on Zooms and like that policing does not work on me. And it's not in the sense that I'm actively resisting it, but my kids are running in the background. My network is, I, my like dirty laundry is in the, you can see it behind me. And when I'm doing Zoom, because that's the only room that's like partly, um, um, you know, private. Um, I'm right. Some people eat during regular class. <laughs> um, I actually don't care at all if people eat, as long as they're not on their computers. Because I feel like you can pay attention to people while you're eating, but not while you're on a computer. Um, uh, but there, so there's this idea of almost like we need to recreate a classroom out of rules, right? Like, well, I need you to show, I need to, you know, I need to like, um, um, and, and, I, and I wonder how effective that is. I mean, I don't know, because I, when I did online teaching, I didn't have anything like that. Um, but it almost seems to me like this mark of like the teacher has this feeling of desperation or something. Like I've got to do something to counteract the fact that we are not in this, we are not playing the same game. And maybe if I create a bunch of rules and then we all agree to them, then it will be more like we're playing the same game. <laughs> That's right, you guys are all on your computers now. I cannot tell you to get off your computers. Okay, let's hear your question and your name. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew, and my question is a little bit of a pivot from the direct gaming theme, but maybe related. Uh, it's about travel. Before COVID-19, uh, travel was one of the ways that we injected randomness and spontaneity into our lives and, and learned and had fun. Um, and what do you think the best replacement is for that in lockdown times? I've seen a lot of uh, articles being written about this in travel magazines, desperate for content lately. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of compelling answers, and I'm interested if you think there's something out there that uh, some of us aren't thinking of. Thanks. So I'm super yeah. like contrarian about travel. Um, like I think it's bad, basically. <laughs> so if we're not doing it, all the better. Um, that's a sim simplistic version of my view. Um, I've written a piece for The New Yorker about this, uh, and it will come out eventually one day, but it'll be a while because I wrote it before coronavirus, and now it's kind of like, you know, writing this piece against travel that no one can do is, it's maybe not, not the time. But, um, you know, I have this thought that like when we travel, like a lot of forms of travel involve holding one thing really fixed, which is like who you are. <laughs> and like, so you're like, oh, I'll do this vacation and I'll go to France. But like the one thing that I'm sure about is that I'll come home and I'll have the same spouse and the same job and the same hobbies and the same et cetera, et cetera, that I had before, right? Like one thing I'm sure about is that I will not be changed by this experience. <laughs> and it's like, I go into the experience. The example I use in the piece actually is going to Abu Dhabi 
and I went to this Falcon hospital. And I'm like, why am I going to a Falcon? Like, I don't care about falconry. I'm not into falcons, you know, but it's like the thing you do there is you go to this, everyone, it's one of the tourist things. That's what you do when you're a tourist is you do the tourist things that other tourists do, right? Mm -hmm. And you do those things. And it's like, I had no thought, zero thought that I was going to get into falconry. Okay. That was not on the radar. That was not a possibility, right? So we do these things when we travel where we kind of fake interests. Like we go to museums, even though we're not into museums, we go to Falcon hospitals, even though we're not into falconry. And that like a lot of it is this kind of almost, I feel like weird game that we play with time where we feel like, especially as you get older, if you don't travel, it just feels like your life is gonna be this and this and this and this and this until you die. And travel breaks it up. So it's not, so you don't have to face death as much. So that's like, you know, deep skepticism about travel that I have. Um, and I feel like, you know, what's really important in life is like the things that really fundamentally change you. And no travel I've ever done has really changed who I am that much. Though this summer I did go to Brazil and that was the most that most transformative travel I've had in a long time. Um, but um, I would say it's still really hard to do those transformative things because they tend to involve other people. But I view the non-travel thing as less of a loss. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when, when I travel, like in order to add a little bit of texture beyond um, these touristy kind of things that one does, like I'll oftentimes try to read, you know, like something written by someone who's lived in that place for a long time. Say if I'm going to like an island like Antigua or something, I would read Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place um, and, and have a different kind of relationship to that place. Admittedly still one of a tourist, but not where one is merely doing the kind of simulated tourist activities. I mean, like, like you, I... I I travel too much, but have tried to less even before this uh, because of just the carbon footprint, right? I mean, like any awareness of climate change suggests that like we shouldn't be flying in particular as as much as um, we are. But but to speak to the question of like what one would do in place of like the pleasures of travel, right? The the discovery, the being in another place, but still being yourself, unfortunately, or wh whatever, right? Is um, is and I've been doing this over the last so I mean I felt a little bit constrained in the house not like stir crazy uh, but I've been playing a lot of uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild which Ashlyn knows um, because Ashlyn um, has been trying to get me to play more Animal Crossing and not as much Breath of the Wild um, or both to be fair. Um, um, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. That's fair. Um, and, and you know, and Breath of the Wild has a world that's like larger than Manhattan in, in, in terms of like walking through it, right? So it's huge. It has like all these landscapes and they're they're not photorealistic, but they're close and they have elements of that. Um, and so being in that world feels like expansive enabling and brings with it a lot of the pleasures of going on a hike minus whatever the, you know, the high that you get from walking or running um, a great deal. So, so for me, playing open world video games has been sufficient, but I'm also wired in a very particular way. Cool. Okay, Ashlyn, you have someone's question? Oh, yes, it's me again, just your <laughs> neighborhood night owl. Uh, <laughs> is overstimulation a good, a good substitute to boredom? Are the two really that different? And this is a question uh, from Brand uh, Brandon Murphy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll say something about boredom. I, and Agnes, maybe you'll have something about both yeah. boredom and overstimulation. Boredom is really interesting to me. Like, I, <laughs> I don't feel bored very often. Like, I, I, I just feel like I find something interesting in almost any situation that I'm in. And that was like one of the things that I feel lucky for having had like a liberal arts education, where I was forced to find a lot of things interesting and and was given frames, whether it was like science or social science or humanities or whatever, um, to look at stuff and think about it. But um, one, of, one of my friends and colleagues who teaches at the University of Toronto, Scott Richmond, um, has written about um, the distinction between like uh, profound boredom and vulgar boredom. So profound boredom, which also comes up in like in philosophy, right? Like, I mean, Heidegger talks about this form of boredom. Um, or, or like, okay, so if, if I'm watching like an Andy Warhol film, um, like Empire or something, which is just like the Empire State Building for 24 hours, and it's like the most boring thing ever, right? But, but like, I go into watching some subset of that Andy Warhol film 
uh, knowing that I'm going to be bored, knowing that this is going to be repetitive, knowing that this is art house cinema. And so I'm able to enter a space of boredom that actually produces novel thoughts that I wasn't expecting to have. And so there's like a profound modernist boredom that comes with that experience versus like vulgar boredom, which like, you know, for Scott is, is like, um, um, for him, it was going to see Inception, which I actually quite liked, but, and somebody mentioned in the chat before, for Scott, like seeing Inception was like vulgarly boredom, boring because it was like, he wasn't getting any, anything out of it. It was a terrible film for him. There was nothing redeemable about the two hours that he lost. And each of us has an ex example of this, right? Like something that bores us to tears, but feels like violently boring. Um, and so um, anyway, I, I would just want to preserve that space of different kinds of boredoms that leave you in a different place on the other end. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, for me, it was that movie. Um, oh, God, what, the new Terrence Malick movie about that hero. Uh, um, what was it called? Um, he's like this World War II hero. Um, but it's basically the whole movie is farming. Like they're just digging dirt and like really like real time farming basically. It's so boring. It's like three hours. Um, that for me was violently boring. Um, um, so I guess one thing about overstimulation is like for me, the opposite tends to be a problem. Um, I, uh, I listen to music like, you know, I don't know, between eight and 10 hours a day usually like while I'm working, like I like there to be like a lot of colors. Like my son came into the room that I'm working in today and he was like adding like pipe cleaners and stuff for me to like for the room to be more colorful cause it's too like, you know, bland. Like I like to be like looking at a lot of stuff and listening to music and reading stuff and like writing and doing all those things at the same time. And like, if some of that is shut out, like if I, sometimes I just, I'm at a conference, whatever, and I can't listen to music a lot during the day. And like, I'm just, um, I sort of like shut down and I don't feel well. And that's like, I guess, under stimulation. Um, but I don't know that I've ever experienced overstimulation except things being too loud or too bright like that's, but that's like a sensory problem. It's not like too much information. It's like, you know, uh, sensory violence. Um, so um, maybe for me, the only form of overstimulation that I get is overstimulation of social interaction. I would say that, but that I feel like it's almost because socializing with people involves actually really cutting down on how much information you're taking in, right? So like, even now we're socializing, right? But like, I'm not listening to music. I'm not reading. I'm occasionally reading. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading how I'm saying they also grab each other's faces quite a bit in that movie. Yes, it's farming and face grabbing. That's it. Um, uh, this is a problem I have. I like touch my face way too much. Like I, I need to be in isolation, or I would, be, you know, there would, would be problems. Um, yeah, touching your face is also a form of stimulation, right? Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say for me, my, my experience overstimulation for me just means like I was at a conference and I had to socialize. There were too many like lunches and chats and stuff. That's what that's what overstimulation is in my life. Yeah, and, and also like, you know, somebody was saying, um, as you were talking, that overstimulation is also, or, or boredom are like both subjective to some degree, right? So I, I can imagine situations in which like, I actually experience like an ecstasy through overstimulation, right? Ecstasy in the sense of like, like the etymological sense of like being outside of oneself, right? And, the, and so for instance, like, for someone who likes to play poker, online poker in particular, right? Like you, you could have like hundreds of hands of poker going at the same time. Like from some standpoint, that's overstimulation because you have just like way too much information, but there's a kind of sublimity for that person um, in terms of having to like quickly modulate among all of those different games. Mm -hmm. Like I do this with chat sometimes, right? Like, like for whatever reason, like I, I will want to have like you know, like 20 chats with people at the same time and type quickly and move among them really quickly. And, and it puts me in a calm state, which is weird, but you know, um, but so there are ways in which like a, a, the over of overstimulation can be like pejorative or judgmental in a way that it doesn't have to be, right? I mean, there could be like intense stimulation or like whatever, whatever boredom ends up being. Um, mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'm gonna read the next question, um, also from uh, Joshua Maroney, who was just up here. Um, what would community without exclusion look like? 
And Shelby, Hannah asked a related question. Isn't this night owl event still a community because people are self-excluding, i.e. deciding not to participate? Good, yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine what it would be like if everybody in the world were here on night owl. <laughs> so like we literally, we wouldn't be able to read the chat, right? Cause it would go so fast. Um, so there are kind of physical limits to communication, right? And um, the internet has made like the, has lowered the bar in the sense that more people can communicate together, right? I even just think Crowdcast as a platform allows more people to be in a community than if we were just thinking, oh, we only had Zoom or we only had Twitch or something. This allows for a certain kind of possibility. So it's a I think to be a contingent question, right? Um, probably depends on what technology we have. Um, but I do, I think there's this weird thing where people feel united by the idea that they're outsiders. And I and I think a lot of times for people, the idea of self-exclusion isn't good enough. Like they want to be able to exclude. Um, and I wonder, I, like I genuinely wonder why that is. And it may be that, um, it may be that it feels like the group is about something or based on something or grounded on something when there's some kind of principled way to exclude people on the outside like it it's not just a ragtag bunch of misfits who you know like decided to do this thing it's like we have like a principle of unity you might say it's like there's a reason we're together and it, it sort of might it, you might argue unless there are people who who are excluded there can't possibly be a reason that we're together I think that's unfortunately right. I mean, right, like when oftentimes when you use the word community, some of us mean that in like a utopian sense of like, you know, like unfettered connection or something, but such a thing doesn't really exist for the most part. I mean, there's certainly like inclusive communities and exclusive communities, but in any community, um, if only because there's not enough, you know, there's not world enough in time, um, there are certain kinds of de facto exclusions. like there are people who may be uncomfortable using Crowdcast um, who wouldn't join us today, but might join us in person or vice versa. Um, but, you know, one thing that I'll say about community too is um, I oftentimes think about this um, uh, B Benedict Anderson book, Imagined Communities, right? Which basically talks about the way that earlier media like newspapers formed a se sense of uh, nationhood, right? So you understood, you, you understood yourself to be an American because of the newspaper that you would read every morning if you had access to that, knowing that a bunch of other people across the country were reading that same newspaper and had that same set of information and priorities. Um, and so any community is also mediated by um, some communications platform, some medium, and, and an imagination, right? Like I, like, I haven't met most Americans. I haven't met most members of any given community, but I have a sense of what that community is based on certain representations and based on um, a subset of conversations within that community. Yeah, I, I just Googled like definition of community because somebody asked about that. And it said like a group of people living in the same space and having something in common, which is in interestingly totally doesn't work for us, right? Um, yeah. But this idea that, you know, it sort of relates to this point about being alone together, right? The idea of a community isn't supposed to be just a bunch of people alone together. It's actually supposed to be a bunch of people together together. And I think that a lot of the time that idea is like, well, we have something in common and the people who don't have that in common don't belong in our community, right? And so it's not necessarily any kind of aggressive impulse towards those people, but that we actually lose that, we lose our basis for, um, uh, being together together as opposed to alone together if we don't have that thing in common. And, and sometimes that thing that you have in common is the starting point, right? I mean, it may be religious belief or something. And sometimes, and I think this is harder, is like a community that is looking for a series of shared principles or texts or occasions or stuff like that. Um, it, and, and that kind of improvised community, I think, is more rare, or or even if it's not, it doesn't last as long. It oftentimes like calcifies into something that's that's more set and has a series of rules that are no longer being negotiated. 
All right, uh, last question before I disappear and ask the other question askers to come back up here. Uh, this is from Miranda Zhang. Often we're expected to be a available 24-7 um, by phone slash online. Considering coronavirus has forced most uh, work to move online, how do we effectively set up work-life boundaries? <laughs> I, I love when people, it's a great question, I, but I also love when people ask questions about work-life balance to faculty at the University of Chicago <laughs> who are completely ill-equipped to answer that question. I'm, I'm making fun of us, not you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is a, it is, it's a real issue. I mean, like, you know, um, Ashlyn and I, as, as forecasters running this game that I sent you the link for, uh, you know, we're like up adjudicating answers and stuff like that at like 2 a.m. a couple of days ago. And so, you know, like we're very bad at times at drawing those boundaries, but it's important to do so. I don't know if you have any strategies, Agnes, for drawing the line generatively. Um, no, uh, I, uh, I once taught in this summer course, actually I took the courses too, but I taught, um, um, Greek and Latin and the way this coursework was very intensive was city university of New York. The students were required to call the teachers with questions at any time, 2 AM, 3 AM. If they had the question, they had to ask it then because the idea was like, if you wait until the next morning, like we're moving on, you know? And I remember trying to explain this to my parents, like the phone might ring at 2 a.m. I got to answer it and I got to, I didn't have a cell phone at the time. It was a while ago. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, sorry, it wasn't philosophy. It was, it's like, it's a Latin emergency. And I have to answer the question about like, why is this in the data or something? You know, and that just has always seemed normal to me. And I know it's not normal, um, but it didn't bother me at all. Like it, that students would call me at 2 a.m. and ask me like Latin grammar questions. And, um, I do feel like it's been different for, I've noticed like administrators now and stuff, I'm getting emails from them like 10 o'clock at night, which I never used to, right? And so, uh, you know, I've always been the one who emails people at 10 o'clock at night, but I feel like in a way what's happened is that the whole world has adopted my schedule. So, every, so it feels more normal to me. I get email, quick email responses from people who it would have been like, they do it over the weekend or whatever. So yeah, I, I feel work-life balance falling apart for everybody else. But for me, that's just really normal. I mean, it, it's interesting, like, I, I, I think oftentimes about what the role of technology is in those processes. And I don't think, like, technology causes that in any way, shape, or form. Like, I don't believe in technological determinism, but there is a way in which, like, I mean, if you think about what a, what a computer is, like, right, computers used to be computational devices during World War II, right? They were used to, like, you know, like, break the Enigma machine and engage in cryptography and mathematical calculations. And then sometime in the 1960s, there was this transition of computers being treated as like meta simulation machines where you could simulate um, images and you could simulate audio, right? Like when I see an image on a screen, like that is reducible to ones and zeros, right? It isn't the image itself. Um, it's an approximation of the image in some ways, but a computer in fact became this mode of, um, this medium of, of, of expressivity that it wasn't in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, and that, um, that opened up um, all these possibilities, right? So suddenly on one machine, you can have a Word document and an Excel spreadsheet and a Twitch channel and a video game going at the same time. So that blurring of boundaries between what is labor or work and what is play um, suddenly becomes more pronounced than it ever was before. And it becomes easier to lose track of time. Um, it becomes, you know, there are like various like insomnia effects that come with like being in front of a particular kind of screen as well. So this is just to say that there is like a role that like the computer as such, and then like something like email plays in the difficulty in policing those boundaries. Yeah, good. This could be just another instance of the sort of hyper attention versus deep attention thing where it's like, we, you know, work had more of the structure of deep attention, like, okay, now you're at work, you're doing work stuff, and you're not doing other stuff, versus if, um, in a sense, your workplace is something you can take with you, your computer, right, um, then you're much more inclined to drift into hyper attention. Um, and, you know, well, here's one thing I've noticed, and I'm curious, um, maybe, maybe, Ashton, you can put up a poll to this effect. Have you um, found it harder to concentrate, like since, since coronavirus, have you found it harder to concentrate on something like reading a novel 
um, or something where it would be the natural would be deep into like, like, has this period of time itself become a period of hypertension for people? That's what I hear online. I haven't quite found I haven't experienced the change, but maybe I was already, you know, um, but um, um, it may be a time where it's not just our work life balance, but actually the quality of our attention is changing. Um, and so we're doing less work during work time, and then we're doing more, um, more of it at other times. And I often hear people saying that that's not healthy. They're like, oh, you should have, and maybe that's true um, for some people that it's like, you should have these lines between work and non-work. Um, I believe that that might be unhealthy for some people. I don't think it's unhealthy for me. So I think one question is like, also should you have a work-life balance? <laughs> um, for some people, it works better not to separate those things. Right. And, and this is like, there, there's a first, for some of you who are part of the chat, I mean, who are still students in particular, I, you know, this becomes like a really important life question, right? Of like what kind of life you want to live and where you want those boundaries to be and what's most fulfilling to you, right? I mean, there are, I mean, it's interesting, like the way a lot of work is structured, um, you know, if you go and work for Google or you work for Riot Games and are at one of their campuses, right? Those campuses are built to like keep you there as long as possible, right? They have gyms mm -hmm. and they have cafeterias with chefs and they have like, you never have to go home if you don't want. And it's true for some people, like that's exploitative, right? That's like mm -hmm. kind of like neoliberal capitalism at its worst um, is that blurring of work play where everything becomes work. But for other people, it's like, if, if you choose the work and you want the work, um, like, um, that's exactly where you get fulfilled, right? It's not workaholism. It, it's it's um, like like for like I I feel very lucky getting to you know like work with with all of you and be at a university and do research. And so like uh, like there are times where whatever like I, I watch a lot of television. Like I'm not trying like I, I watch way too much television and play way too many games and then justify it by writing about it and turning it into my scholarship. But like. Um, but so, so I do draw the line some places with that, but other times, like I, I just want to be activated and doing the work uh, continuously. Cool. We have a question um, from Fasi Zulfikar. Uh, your favorite video games? What are they? Patrick, better okay, answer I, this one. <laughs> no, 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 I'm curious what your answer is. Um, I have an answer, but. I mean, it's such an impossible, like, like for me, that, that it's a great question. And I'm more curious as to like, if, if you all want to just like throw out stuff on chat. Yeah, um, everyone sure, say your favorite video game on chat too. While yes, we're it's, it's like one of these impossible questions of like, what is, what is your favorite novel where, it, you know, like it changes depending on the moment, right? So like right now I'm playing immense amounts of uh, Breath of the Wild. Um, and so that's become my favorite game. Sometimes I claim Earthbound, um, for the Super Nintendo is my favorite game, or um, you know, sometimes you know, games like Undertale or Return of the Obra Dinn feel like my favorite game, but it, it's just it's impossible to answer. It's a good question. I feel like but it's super you? easy for me to answer because I like remember like two games. <laughs> One of them is Myst. It was like M Y S T. Um, it was sort of this puzzle game. Um, um, where you were sort of solving this mystery. And then the other is Oregon Trail, <laughs> which is like this oh, yeah. text game, but I loved it. Like I was obsessed with it. Um, so um, those were both games where I really like became drawn in the space of the game and nothing else in my life seemed to matter. And like, it, it didn't even feel like a game. It felt like that was what was happening in my life at the time it was like, I was playing Oregon Trail, I was playing Mist, and like everything else was just to get out of the way so yeah. I could play those games. And so for me, like there have just been a few games like that that like totally take over my reality. Totally, and there are a lot of games like that that are being mentioned in the chat right now. So things like Minecraft, Disco Elysium, Tetris, Super Mario Galaxy, Portal, which is like a good, good get answer. Um, Fire Emblem, Civilization Five. I mean, there. This is like an amazing reading list or playing <laughs> list. Um, I guess I, I think of it as a reading list. But um, Oregon Trail has made it on there. Sekiro, great. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi there. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. My question is: Are our major social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram too similar? Um, I don't know if you know of Tristan Harris. 
um, who used to work at Google, but he's uh, really surfaced a lot of what goes on behind the scenes at places like Facebook when they're determining, you know, how to get people to stay on the site and, and look at the content. So given that we're spending a lot of time in these environments these days, are they all sort of too similar with the systems of likes and upvoting and um, those mechanisms? I tried to get that guy, Tristan Harris, to come do Night Owls with me, but I, I couldn't get him to respond. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about this. Um, so I've been, I, I, I've spent very little time on Instagram and then, but a lot of time on Facebook and a lot of time on Twitter, a lot more time on Twitter than Facebook. So here's what I'll say about my experience. So on Facebook, I have a secret identity. So none of you, I mean, I have a real Facebook, whatever with my name, but I never go on there, but I have another secret identity, Facebook. I use it entirely for Australian fashion so for me like there's an Australian fashion world that I'm a part of like this sweater is from Australia um most of my clothing is from Australia um and um like I I grew up in Australia. sorry I grew up in Australia really um, in Sydney yeah, yeah, yeah okay well my people are mostly in Melbourne but um <laughs> so um, I was gonna go there this summer and like meet these people but sadly that trip had to get canceled um but um, I, um, for me, like Facebook allows me to have like Facebook friends and then like be in this little special world of like, of like Australia fashion. And it's t totally different from Twitter, like a totally different experience from Twitter. Um, Facebook is a little overwhelming for me in terms of the multiple like windows and things that are all going on. And I actually find it a little bit hard to manage and Twitter is much more intuitive and it's much more text-based. And the limit of the text also means that I tend to go through and read everything. Um, and the people I know on Twitter are the people I like, you know, they're sort of, a lot of them are philosophers or have some kind of philosophy connection. And I would like do philosophy on Twitter. So I feel like Facebook feels more like a place to me where there are these like little pockets, little pockets of weirdness and refuge or something. Um, and Twitter feels more public. Yeah. I mean, I think there are like a lot of differences that one could point out historically also, given how the platforms changed. Like there was a time where like there wasn't a news feed on Facebook and then that changed everything, for instance. But one of the things that, or, or for instance, like Instagram, like you can't see how many likes there are now unless you're the one who's doing the posting, right? Which actually mm. does change the dynamic compared to Facebook where, you know, you see that a hundred people liked something versus two. Um, but what I find really amusing socially is that out of those three in particular, I mean, there's obviously like Snapchat and TikTok and stuff like that too, but like, especially Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I know a lot of people who, you know, like swear by one and think the other is the devil. Um, like, like I'm not on Twitter, but I am on Facebook and Instagram or like I am on Twitter with like my, my game aliases, but not my, my actual self. And, 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 you know, and so like, like I would be, I would have a lot of negative things to say about Twitter, for instance, but in fact, there aren't that many, differences between the two, right? Or I know people who are, who love Instagram and think Facebook, you know, like leads to this de-evolution of discourse or something. But in fact, if you look at the two platforms, yes, there are differences. Yes, there are differences. But they're used in similar ways sometimes too. Hmm. Hey. Oh. Um, so my question was, yeah. wasn't social media already becoming a predominant mode of conversation before lockdown. So in the sense that I was pretty surprised when everyone was suddenly shocked that they are on social media because I thought the biggest problem we were facing was that people were on social media a lot before the lockdown. And now suddenly everyone's like, we had a social life and I don't think that exists. So that's my <laughs> question that, uh, cool. how, like, cool. yeah. has this brought back the attention to physical contact and are we overthinking this? Basically. Yeah. yeah. So one thing is I've noticed uh, there's at least noticed, like, uh, there's at least like, are you hearing an echo? Yeah, I suddenly heard an echo. Okay. But now it's, I think maybe it was your microphone. Okay. So, um, uh, there are like 10 philosophers who joined Twitter over the past, um, about a couple of weeks. So I actually think there is an influx of people and I'm getting more Twitter followers over the past like three weeks I would say the number of followers I get a day has maybe doubled right so I think I think there is a real influx onto social media um, and I think people who spend time on social media are spending more time on it it's definitely true of me 
Um, so I think like, I think you're right that it was already a big thing and people were already doing a lot, but maybe it's like the thing you said earlier about video games, Patrick, where it's like before it was the enemy and now it's like the friend, right? So it's like before it was like, oh no, social media. Now it's like, oh, at least we have social media. Um, I think people are less inclined to view it negatively. I did a poll, I did a Twitter poll. Like, do you think Twitter has gotten better or worse? And I did a poll like this, like a year ago, is Twitter getting better or worse? And a lot more people thought it was getting better now than did a year ago. So the I think whether Twitter has actually gotten better, people's perception of it, at least the whatever, 200 people or whatever that answered my Twitter poll, was that, it, that coronavirus had made Twitter better. And I think it might just be a partly a question of like, what are your alternatives? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, like I've got, I've got a lot more friend requests since this has started all like like in a very concentrated way, but but it's true. I mean, there are like two and a half billion Facebook users in the world right now, I think more or less, uh, I would have to look it up, but I think it's close to two and a half billion. Um, and that was obviously like, like on its way up. And even when that's like, when people are like, I'm going off of Facebook and then come back a month later, as oftentimes is the case. Um, that oftentimes happens in like the US where there was already saturation, but there's in places like India, for instance, right? I mean, there's there's a growth of social media users in an ongoing way. So there's also a transnational component to this. Yeah. Hey. Hi, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi, this is Daniela. Um, my question is, what is the relationship between social media and authenticity? And does social media promote or preclude authenticity? Thanks. Ooh, good question. Yeah, good question. Patrick, I mean, I, I, I'm really curious, Agnes, what, what you think about authenticity as a concept. It's one, it's one that, you know, like, I mean, as, as someone who has always been interested in like performance studies and like, you know, read Judith Butler at a formative moment and stuff like that, performance and performativity have always seemed to me to be a more productive frame for thinking about subjectivity in the present, right? So like I grew up again, like in chat rooms and virtual worlds and online games. And so from a very early moment, the idea of having multiple selves didn't feel like a postmodern metaphor. It felt like just the way that I lived my life, right? I mean, I, it, like, and, and I know the idea of an authentic self is really important to some people. So I'm not trying to undermine that. I'm just saying that from, from my perspective, I think, and, and for this, for me, it was also the effect, I think, of like traveling around a lot and having a lot of different friend groups and stuff like that. Like, I never felt at home in any particular place, and I never felt that authenticity was particularly enabling, right? I actually thought that the flexibility that came with multiple identities online or just in everyday life, um, you know, was there were there were more possibilities with what one could could do there. So, like, I, I don't see you know, like a lot of authenticity on social media maybe, but I don't necessarily see it anywhere, right? Like like any given student, like the kind of conversation that I have with a student, the kind of conversation that I have with my mother, the kind of conversation I have with a colleague are gonna take different tones and I'm gonna enter into different kind of discursive norms and forms of authenticity in each of those contexts. It's not that I'm being fake with any given person, I'm just like performing a different kind of self relative to like, the potential of that particular relation and situation. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, um, I think that I, I share your sort of like lack of worry about authenticity, but for the opposite reason. So I don't tend to experience myself as having multiple selves. I think that I am very much the same when I'm parenting, when I'm teaching right now. Maybe I am different. I'm just saying I don't experience it. Um, yeah. And for me, it's like, the, so we we were a paper that we had planned to talk about. We kind of digged around to this paper, wonderful paper by um, uh, Nagel called like uh, what is it, concealment? And uh, I don't remember. I'll, I'll find it. Um, um, but it's about concealment and exposure. Yeah. Concealment and exposure, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, uh, about the public-private divide and this idea that like. We need to have a public-private boundary because it's sort of only in pri like private that we could be our sort of true selves, and we we need this sort of space of freedom. And I think that's related to the idea of authenticity. And my experience of the world is very different from that. It's that 
I don't know what I think until I say what I think. Like, I don't have this experience of like in my head, I, I have it. And then I, and then I can either say it or not say it. It's like, it becomes true that I think it when I say it. And so for me, like contexts in which people will listen to me are the contexts in which I can be myself because I, maybe I'm a very performative person or something like that, or very communicative. And, but I do feel like for a lot of people, um, that's not the case. And there's a lot of worry about judgment on social media. Like what will people think of me and will they judge me and will they dislike? Me? And uh, I think that, um, I'm not sure why I don't experience that as much. And it's not that I don't care at all. I think people tend to like me. Um, so maybe I have an easy time being likable when I'm performing. Um, uh, but I think that, um, I suppose the danger, if I try to construct the danger, the danger would be that you, you know, you turn that whole thing into a game, right? Where you're playing a game that you don't necessarily like, and you don't necessarily like the rules, but other people have set the rules for how yourself is allowed to be. And you experience that as confining. Uh, and, um, and so like the danger of authenticity there would be more like, um, you know, are you in some sense violently constraining yourself according to rules that other people have set and that don't allow you free play of expression for who you are? Um, uh, and, but for me, it's less an issue of like, like, are there facts about me that are the case antecedently that I'm not, because it's like, I wouldn't even know those facts where, I, where I not to have a context to express them in. I mean, one term to add to this is just that, you know, whenever you're on, I mean, first of all, people game algorithms all the time, right? Like I might game an algorithm and ask a question on Facebook rather than like producing a multi-paragraph post, because I know that statistically people are more likely to respond to a question or to a short statement or an image than they are otherwise. And, and at that moment, I want attention. I feel alone or I want like my world to speak back to me. And so I game the algorithm in order to get that kind of response. Or, you know, people do this professionally all the time, right? I mean, if you're like um, like an Instagram star or you have a YouTube channel, you, you're you not necessarily your authentic self. You're performing in order to get an audience. And where you draw the line between the authentic and the performed is difficult when a bunch of what you're doing on social media is telling stories, right? I mean, you're forming narratives. Um, so you're taking experience that you might have had and shaping it as we do in everyday conversation all the time, right? Shaping it into a form uh, that's more palatable or interesting to people. So at that that moment of translation, right? I mean, you're always entering into something that is like a form of authenticity or a cleverly constructed fiction or a para self or something like that. I mean, yeah. Mm, yeah, good, right. And so there's a question of how good the story is in some sense. Right, I, I think so. Hey. Hi. Uh, sorry, my friend just told me he's gonna send me memes to make me laugh while I'm up here, so I just have to ignore him. <laughs> we just yeah. started. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is my question: um, Do online communities and constant communication through technology contribute towards overstimulation? And is this new way of communicating bad for the development of long-form traditional ways of introspective thinking? Thank you. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I mean, go ahead. I, what I want to say is this is for me very closely related to the previous question because it's like I can only introspect when I'm talking. That's the only time I can introspect. That's how I figure out what I think. You answer, and then I'll, maybe I'll say something else. But that was just my instinctive response. I mean, so, so, so my my general sense is like, like I never want to be judgmental of any particular platform or medium unto itself, right? Like in any medium, whether it's television or games or social media, like there are bad examples and there are good examples, right? I mean, like the internet produces like, you know, trolls and forms of sexism, but it also produces like communities and, and creative capacities and collaborations that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And I think there, this is not to say that like technology is neutral, right? I mean, what happened with Facebook during the 2016 um, US election and, what happened with Cambridge Analytica, for instance, right, for instance, was very suggestive of problems with 
insulated communities, which is what social media produce, right? Like, I think I'm speaking to the world at some level when I post something on Facebook. But in fact, I'm speaking to a very small subset of people who probably, for the most part, share my political views, share my aesthetic proclivities, and will debate me, but within like a very narrow set of expectations, which is exactly what was exploited uh, during the 2016 election, right? So one could argue that that was um, like a negative dimension of overstimulation and social media that produced uh, negative effects for democracy. Um, but of course, like one could imagine, could cite a bunch of examples of like, you know, Twitter revolutions or whatever, um, in which social media are used to connect people and produce like uh, viable activist movements. Yeah, I um, I really like that point that um, one th one problem with social media is that you think it's more public than it is. It's actually like it's it's sort of too private. When I first joined Twitter, I was really puzzled that nobody was responding to my tweets. Like I would ask a question, I would say something. It's like no one was seeing it because I didn't have any followers it was two years ago. You know. Like I didn't get that like when you don't have any followers, nobody sees what you're tweeting. I just, I thought it was public, right? And so there's this way in which it isn't actually public. It's like this private, but indeterminate in a way. It's like, and that's a new thing that we haven't had before where you could have a closed group that you're speaking to, but you don't know what that closed group is. Um, and they're selected for in ways that you can't control and don't know about. Like they're like you. Like I once did a, a you know, there was a service you could do where you could find the, the gender profile of your Twitter followers. And I found that like mm -hmm. some very high percentage were male. Like that was a surprise to me that like most of my, I, mean, I think it's just Twitter skews male. Um, but like, I didn't know that I didn't, I hadn't been thinking of myself as speaking to an audience of mostly men. Um, so that's like a thing where it's like, it's a closed group, but you don't, you don't know the boundaries of it, how it's closed. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Hello Actually. again. Uh, a question from uh, Russell Holt Smith: Does our understanding of personality uh, phenotypes, pop psych kinds, bias us online? Hmm. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to parse the personality phenotypes part of that. Um, like, like disagreeableness or. Um, extrovertedness, right. or like that's the kind of stuff. I guess these are these are five factor. Um, I, I I would say no, just because like it would actually be somewhat harder to classify people. Um, I would think online, but maybe other people have a different experience. I don't feel like I make those those kinds of. I mean, I don't know that I make them anyway, but um, uh, I, I don't feel that it's especially easy to make those classifications online. Right. I mean, it, it depends. Like, you, you can certainly, like, like, given a person's, like, frequency of posting, you know, like, like, wordings, performativeness, whatever. I mean, like, there, there are things that you could probably figure out. And that may, that may not be the kind of the center of the question. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's probably hard to figure out if somebody's, like, introverted versus extroverted um, in that context, if that distinction is even valuable, which I'm, right. like, I'm almost sorry to introduced it, but... <laughs> right. Well, and it's also just things like neuroticism or something like that could show up. Someone could be extremely neurotic in a lot of ways, but it just doesn't show up on their online behavior or something. So. Um, right. Or, or like, like people sometimes have like very specific uses of social media, which we haven't talked about very much. Like I may be someone who like doesn't want to get into any political debates online because I love, maybe I love politics, but I just think it's not particularly productive but I love posting pictures of my cat on Instagram. And that like, that's what Instagram is to me. It's like a, a platform for posting pictures of my cat for other cat lovers. And that's that, or, or maybe like I have Twitter because there's a group of um, scholars in the digital humanities that I want to be in conversation with. And that's the best forum to do that. But I don't use it for, you know, engaging with Trump's tweets or something like that. I, don't, I you know, I don't know. Um, so that's the other thing is, is, is like social media, like sometimes we think of them as just like the world, right? As a window into the world that opens us up to like what other people are doing and what they're thinking. But for some people, it's, it's not that. It's, it's like, it's a little toy or a tool among many other tools. Hmm. Yeah, good. And one thing that's interesting about that, just one, um, 
is that there's a weird way in which those kind of toys or tools or constrained spaces are kind of windows, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe one of the things is that we have a bad view of window. Like there's this idea like, oh, we could be talking to everyone, but like that just might not be a thing. Like it might be kind of like the blank piece of paper, right? The talking to everyone. And it may be that new modes of speech come into existence and there really are new windows because we can create sort of constraints of a new kind. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hi there. Hey, Patrick. Hey, how's it going? So my question was uh, sort of to relate the first two topics that you all were talking about today. Uh, do you all think that there are forms of intimacy that are unique to games? And that could be outside of digital games too, like in board games. Um, and I'm trying to think if there are forms of intimacy, maybe more than just a shared agreement to enter the magic circle or like the shared creation of a world like in Minecraft or on a, a, a legacy board game? Yeah, I mean, it's such a, it's such a great question, right? Because there are like all these forms of, like for instance, um, there's a feeling, and I'm forgetting the, the exact phrase for it, but there's a feeling of like mentorship that one feels, for instance, like playing a game with someone who isn't as familiar with the game and like teaching them something and then seeing them succeed. I mean, we, we experience this like outside of games as well, but, th but it happens a lot in the world of like playing video games together with someone else and like, like helping them get better rather than competing with them. Or, you know, there's the feeling of playing a tabletop game as, as I've played with you, Phil, um, and I'm playing with a group of people online right now where you um, see that group of people once a week, every week over the course of months or years, and you, form a kind of intimacy with them in character largely, right? Like maybe you have out of character discourse where you're um, um, hanging out or, or drinking or whatever, but like when you're in the role-playing game, um, you end up building this sort of history um, between your characters, right? That, 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 is, that is a form of intimacy um, just, just mediated through this form of, of role-playing and world-building, for instance. And I, th and I think that there are other, other forms of you know, like if you're in a guild in an online game, um, there are forms of responsibility that come with showing up for that guild on a regular basis in order to, um, uh, you know, to go on quests or gather resources or stuff like that. Um, and so like so something like responsibility um, an expectation enters into this. I mean, I, I can think of many other examples, right? I mean, I can like, I'll throw one more out, which is like, I've had situations of, you know, being in a relationship and being in like different places and, and mediating that intimacy by playing a shared game um, over Skype or something, right? Um, and that becomes a way of, you know, or, or never having met somebody, you know, like physically face-to-face -face and only having those conversations happening via, uh, via gameplay. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop, but. Yeah, so one thing that's interesting for me is your character, so in my, I, 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 we play video games, I actually, everyone else in my house plays video games except me, but um, we play a lot of board games and card games, and then we also play D&D. &D. And, um, and role playing for me is very, very different from the other, from board and card games. And so, and, and I'm actually, although I was super into role playing as a kid, I now find that my natural home is in competitive games, like um, board games and card games. And I really like winning and I like fighting against people and like defeating them and trying to win. And I like the fact that when you're competing against someone, it's for me, it's almost like um, itself a form of going online. Because like when you when some you view someone as your competitor, you're almost like not inhabiting the space with them. Like I remember having this epiphany when I was like 10 and I was playing cards with my sister and I was like holding my cards in front of me, open before me, right? And I feel I, I have this world, this rich world of cards. And she is like this point at the other end. She's like this thin dimensionless nothingness. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is what it's like for her. For her, I'm the thin dimensionless point and she's the rich world of the cards, right? And so for me, competitive yeah. games allow you in some sense 
to dehumanize your opponent in the sense that you don't have to fully interact with them and deal with their emotions and deal with their thoughts and like they don't explain their moves and like you live in your own world but you're living in your own world with other people and you're interacting with them in accordance with these rules and so it's almost for me like games were a form of internet (laughs) pre-internet like a way of alienating the people around you into these much more like relegated like strict social interactions and that's much less true of D&D d and is a real social interaction. It's very yeah. social. Yeah. It's very much you play, your personality comes out. And I really like um, the kind of, I don't know, almost you might say sterility and dehumanization of like board games and card games and competitive games. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I'll say, right, is, is if you, re- like a lot of uh, earlier economic game theory, for instance, like makes a very similar set of points, right? I mean, like reading, um, you know, reading stuff about the prisoner's dilemma during the Cold War, for instance, or um, or John Nash or something like that. Like, there oftentimes, like, is the assumption that your competitor is this um, inhuman other, which is, of course, the way that the Cold War at a macro scale arguably was, was also run, if you think about the f- fact that the stakes were, like, the end of the world in terms of the use of nuclear weapons in particular, right? And the idea that you could turn the use of nuclear weapons and like omnicide of the human race into a game via the prisoner's dilemma and various forms of economic game theory, right, is is like an interesting version of the thing that you're describing. You're describing the kind of like the personal intimate gameplay version where you're at home playing a card game or something. And I, and I experienced the same thing that you're describing. But then there's also the way in which like games have been used as metaphors for life as such since World War II, including in economic game theory, um, that take that idea and elevate it to a level where it becomes potentially dangerous, right? Yeah, good. And and I, I totally accept that danger part, but I'm just into the other thought right now, which is like, this has made me understand something, which is that I've kind of craved gameplay more over the past three weeks than I usually do with board games. Like it's quite often it's my kids who are like, come on, can we play a game? Can we play Risk? Can we play, you know, um, yeah. uh, Scythe is a game we're into right now. Um, and I'm, I've been kind of like, I want to play Ticket to Ride. I want to play Scythe. And I think it's that like, it's like I grew up in like a, a, a play a lot with like uh, my family like, we spend the summer in Hungary right and so like my grandparents my uncle we'd all be in, like a small house and it's like you're trapped with people and with their habits and with their selves and the game just erases all of that and it's like this magical thing where you're with all the same people that you were with before but you're apart from them right and so I wonder how much of the sort of social nature of gameplay too in a way dates to a time when people needed to find a way to get away from the people that they were with um get away from people that are around them. And games are a way of doing that. They're a way of escaping other people too. They, they can be, right? I mean, I feel that way when I'm playing a competitive card game or when I'm playing a competitive board game, which is most but not all board games. But then like when I'm playing certain tabletop games or because I'm a total dork playing live action role-playing games, which I've done with Ashlyn before, for instance, um, like, like, like th- those are spaces in which like, you're in the same physical space, you're playing a character, you're improvising over the course of uh, hours at a time. Um, and that feels like immensely communal, social, like I feel activated in terms of the creativity that my body is engaging in, in a way that I usually don't with video games. Um, I mean, I do sometimes when I'm playing with friends and stuff like that, but like in a, an alternate reality game or a live action role-playing game or a tabletop game, um, you know, like like you're not doing the thing where you're holding the cards in front of you and you're othering the other person. Like, in fact, you're trying to figure out exactly who their character is and what their, you know, history and affordances and stuff like that are. Um, so I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not agreeing with you. I'm just kind of like spiraling out the different kinds of cases. And, and game is, I mean, you know, like Wittgenstein's comment about game and the fact that it means like all these different things and we can't like, focus in on like what game is like defining game has become so much more complicated than it used to be. Right. Like the, the, the space of what is called a game has just exploded over the last 30 years. Um, And so it's this, this very ambivalent and multifaceted metaphor and form, uh, which is, which is what I find so interesting about it. It's, it's actually like, I do like games like you, but I actually, but then I also at a meta level just find them fascinating as a way of thinking about life. 
Mm. Um, I want to say one quick thing to Benny's question about do we play games to satiate our primordial hunger to win and beat others? So the hypothesis that I'm, I've, I've always thought sort of yes, and I, I'm someone who very much feels that hunger. But the thing I, I thought I was just having is that maybe, maybe the desire to beat others is itself subordinate to just the desire to be apart from others. That is, this um, the the sort of othering that com competition makes possible is a kind of distance, right? And so it's like, what if you're surrounded by your family members and you're not allowed to see them as enemies? You're not allowed to be like, I hate you, I wanna destroy you because they're your kid or something, right? You cannot do that, it's not permitted, it's not acceptable. Uh, but in a game, it is acceptable, right? And so the, the idea that you wanna destroy them in a game could be instrumental to the idea that you want distance from them, right? So it could be not that we have a primordial hunger to win and beat others, but we have a primordial hunger to separate ourselves from even the people that are physically proximate to us. And desiring to win and beat them is like one way of doing that. that that's a really interesting thing. I mean, that, that idea of like proximity and distance through gaming and role playing is totally fascinating. I mean, the thing, Benny, that I would say about the uh, primor primordial hunger part of that is like, I think about games as being very culturally and historically contingent. In other words, like, like games in the United States tend to be like really, really competitive because we live in a culture that like economically and politically is like values competition in a way that some other cultures might not. Right. And so um, like, I also really enjoy competition, not in like wanting to hurt anybody else. In fact, that stops being fun for me if I am hurting anybody else, but if it's like play fighting or something, right? If it's like dogs biting one another, but not hurting one another in the process. And it's a way of like, like being active with other people that, that, that is engaging that, it, that can be activating. But I sometimes wonder whether that's because like I'm alive at this historical moment and have spent the majority of my life in the United States. Um, like would I feel differently um, if I was in another place in a different time? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like competition, like it's hard for me to imagine a culture of the ones that I'm somewhat familiar with, which is basically like, you know, ours and like ancient Greece, <laughs> that's what I work on. They're both like pretty competitive, right? But they're different forms of it, of it. that's definitely true. Um, um, and- Greece uh, is an interesting example, right? I mean, I mean, Greece, Greece is a really interesting example, right? So like, uh, uh, the anthropologist Thomas Malaby has uh, this book about like chance in Greek culture and games of chance mm. versus games of competition, right? And and so like what chance means in terms of like how it activates fate or how it activates probability, depending on like what discourse you're using. Like like a game of chance that is like a hundred percent based on. Um, on, on chance like like dice or something like that like that's a very different kind of game than um, a like a competitive sport or um, Super Smash Bros or um, Mario Kart or something right which is which is completely competitive and like the, the the world order that comes with like like preferring chance to competition is major right um, and there are other kind of like subcategories of games that we can think about like the um, uh, not, not, not how it's so Roger, Roger Kaiwa, for instance, right? I mean, has a four part scheme of games where he talks about games of competition, games of chance, games of role playing, and games of vertigo, which are more like that last category is kind of weird, weird but it's like being on a tilt a whirl or flying a kite, like something that gives you like a kinesthetic sense of like being in the world and isn't really rule bound in the way that most games are. But anyway, I mean, this is just to say that there are these these different ways of thinking about games and competition has been dominant in the U S for a while, but maybe not in ancient Greece. I don't know. I mean, that's a question mm. for you. Mm. I mean, even we don't, I, a lot of the games, I think we don't know quite how they worked, but like even games that involve things like that, like there's a game Patea, which is like things that are, they're falling. I don't think we know how the game works, but it's something like dice that the name involves things that you drop. Right. But like as a kid, I played a game 
I, it was in Hungary. I've never played in the U.S., but it was called Chicago for some reason. And it was a game with dice, but it was like you had a cup and it had six dice and you rolled them and then you could had to decide how many to re-roll and stuff. And like it was dice, but it was also strategy because of the, these decisions that you had to sort of make. So, I mean, I feel like like one thing that we're negotiating in games is that our lives are a balance between like luck and effort, right? And the game is a reproduction of that fact, um, but almost like a reproduction of it in a space that we feel we can more control. Um, and so we can sort of see the chance part and the um, effort part. Maybe it is Yahtzee. Um, maybe that's just, maybe it was just called Chicago and I never played Yahtzee, so. Um, uh, um, um, I don't know. I don't know whether it's, um, whether it would be very interesting to learn, like whether the chance element of games predominated more in one culture at, at one time or not. I mean, I guess like in chess, for instance, the chance element would be very small. Um, right. And, and I want to be clear because a few people in the chat have basically said like competition isn't unique to the United States or U.S. games. That's 100 percent true. I mean, I, I think it, it's not a question of, I mean, I think many cultures that I can think of at many different times have had competition, chance, role playing, like all of these things, right? It's, for me, it's a question of like, which one becomes dominant at a particular place at a particular time. Um, so like all of them can coexist, but some can like more fully accord with like the ethos of, of a culture or an economic system or uh, a set of political preferences or things like that, right? I mean, it would be an interesting question of like, you know, do people play more competitive games in, um, you know, like capitalist, like full on capitalist societies versus like um, ones that have more of a socialist or communist um, element in them? I don't know. I mean, it, it, that's, that's like an empirically answerable question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Is that all good? Okay, good. So I have a quick one because I got to dip out af after asking the question. But in the kind of spirit of the competition of and, and everything, um, my question was, is trolling necessarily immoral? So would you see trolling as like a competitive thing? Like you're actively trying to go against the grain? And, and some people were comparing it to like Socrates being a gadfly or <laughs> – I, I was thinking more Diogenes because Diogenes was – was more just trying to get everybody's goats and uh, and uh, mess with their their heads a little bit, uh, particularly with the whole ch uh, chicken thing in Plato. But um, so yeah, so that's like kind of the gist of my question: is is that kind of endeavor uh, that that you consider trolling? Is that necessarily like an immoral thing to do? Is it an amoral thing, or um, or does it does it depend? Or what? And another sub question underneath that is: what's even the definition of that? So I got to dip out because I got another meeting to get to. Thank you guys again so much. It's this been an honor. Thanks for your question. I mean, I mean, I think trolling. I, I, you know, I, I don't think trolling is necessarily more like. I mean, I'm going to bear my soul a little bit here. Like, I used to go into like um, different kinds of games or online spaces where um, you know you would have like mean spirited trolls who are trying to like ruin people's fun or you know would throw out like racist comments and things like that. And for a while, like I got really into the idea of like counter trolling. So using like every element in like the trolling playbook, but only directing it toward people who are being like evil or mean spirited or, or, or whatever. And like, like turning their own strategies against them. And I like for a while became very successful at that. And it, it, it became this like fun activity of messing, messing with those people. And, and so at least I didn't think that that was immoral at that moment, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah, good. Um, I think it's really interesting that people think that people tend to think of um, expressions of aggression as being okay if they're directed at aggressors. And I think for that reason, we often look out for aggressors so that we can direct our aggression onto them, right? Um, and I guess I tend to think of... Um, um, you know, it's sort of like, um, if you think that trolling trolls is okay, then you think that trolling is okay, which both, both of them may be okay. Um, um, but it's sort of in both cases, it's just, um, 
a kind of like finding an avenue for aggression. And I bet you that the troll, the original troll, has some reason what they give to themselves, why the aggression can be placed here. Um, and what's interesting, right, is that when we use a word like mean-spirited, it's like then we've classified it as like bad trolling, right? right. Um, or ruining people's fun. And like, I often am, I have the inclination really in any gathering, it could be a faculty meeting, you know, if there's some kind of consensus and I feel that it's not even that it's necessarily wrong, but that people haven't noticed that they're just assuming it, like it's like this instinctive thing where I wanna break it. And I don't know that it is mean spirited, but it, isn't always productive either. It's like a, um, it, and, and I, I think it is a form of trolling. Um, and, you know, I think the group just develops an equilibrium of like how to manage that and like how to make it, like it, it can be made productive by other people almost. Um, but I think that in some way, trolling is like somebody being unhappy with the thought that there's a game going on. Like, there's the, the the troll is in some way um, maybe it's related to your um, your your the type um, the um, the spoil sport the troll is a little bit like a spoil sport right where it's like there's some game but we haven't agreed on that game we haven't agreed that those are the rules mm -hmm. right it's a little bit like the thing I said to you when I said introverts always say that they're introverts but extroverts don't say that they're extroverts I think that's a game it's like a game that we all play with the concept of introvert and extrovert and. Mm -hmm that whenever there's a game like that, but people don't say it, I, my instinct is like, I wanna tell you that we're doing this and that it's just made up and, and I wanna ruin it or something, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's something about the troll is maybe a little bit like the figure of a spoil sport. And then there's just a question, is it bad to be a spoil sport with any kind of game? And like, it might just depend on like how good the game was and whether you can build up another game. Um, but yeah, I see the troll as being that person who's in, in sometimes is sort of, not okay with there being a game. Yeah, I, I really like that that analogy between um, uh, a troll and a spoil sport. Um, and, and in my in my defense, when I was counter trolling, I mean, I was like sixteen, so this is a very <laughs> long time ago. It's not something that I do like between classes now. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, my question earlier, there was a discussion about whether to view life as a game. And my question was just whether or not life is in some sense a game, is it maybe bad or like ethically dangerous to view it as a game? Just in terms of like you were talking about cheating earlier as like it's fun to like bend the rules and go against the purpose of like games and in life that might look like fraud or like people might feel like they're taking control of, of like the rules of life by like random acts of violence or that type of like that type of gamifying feels ethically dangerous if you view life as a game, whether or not it is. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really interesting. You know, what's interesting yeah. is that in this paper that um, Patrick and I read sort of to prep for this, um, this uh, suits paper, Is Life a Game? One thing that he, um, you know, he thinks that it might be a game, but we think that it isn't one. And he's like, I'm not saying we should view it as a game. I'm saying it is a game. Right. Mm -hmm. And then another question you can ask is whether or not it is a game, should we view it as one? It's almost like Pascal's wager, right? It's like, suppose mm -hmm. we don't know whether life is a game or not. It could be a game or it could be a non game, right? But suppose it isn't a game, but we view it as one, then we may be doing something tragic, right? And so it might be safer to view it as a non game if you can't figure out which one it is. There's an argument for that conclusion. Right. I mean, it's interesting too, like if you think about people who use a lot of game rhetoric, like I, I think of people that I know in finance, for instance, right? I mean, who treat the stock market um, as a game that has rules and is winnable. And if you win it, um, the money you get, right? I mean, is, is one marker of that or whatever. Um, and there are costs to that, right? I mean, as we saw with, um, you know, the 2007, 2008 economic crisis, for instance, right? Where like people who are playing the subprime mortgage game, for instance, right? Like we're thinking abstractly in terms of like numbers and bundles of derivatives and stuff like that. They weren't thinking about like the everyday experience of people who would then be suffering as a, as a result of those particular deals. And of course, there are many arguments that one can make in different directions as to like who deserved what um, and so forth in all of that. But this is just to say that like, 
games always have consequences. At the very least, those are emotional consequences. At the very most, they're uh, material consequences. And so I think like it, it is important to think about um, what the game frame is doing in different instances. I mean, Bernard Suits, right? Like the article that we read together, um, you're right. He's not asking, is life like a game? He's asking, is, is life a game full stop? Um, but it's interesting in, in, in the book version that we talked about a little bit, his book, The Grasshopper, he makes a different kind of argument about games, which isn't uh, descriptive, it's prescriptive, right? So he's, he, he argues in that book that utopian existence is fundamentally concerned with game playing, right? So games for suits have an anti-instrumental character and intrinsic motivation, right? So when I play a game, usually like not counting gambling or something like that, if I'm just playing like a board game with friends or family or even strangers, right? I'm playing it because of the inherent joy or series of dynamics that that game brings to the table, right? It's not because of like some external end. Like I work in order to make money. The extrinsic motivation is money, let's say. Um, but Suits' argument is if you can make everything an intrinsic motivation, if you can make everything um, an end in, in, in itself, basically, you, like you'll live a, le a happier life. And in fact, society as such would be better as well. I mean, that's an interesting argument to consider, right? Like, like what do you get if you treat everything like a game in the sense of like um, it being an end in itself, which people debate outside of games rhetoric as well. Yeah, I mean, there it really matters a lot whether you're seeing the game fundamentally as like a rule governed activity that could be an end in itself or as like something fake. <laughs> like, and I think that for me, that second thing where like the game is in some sense not really happening. So if you break the rules of the game, you don't go to jail, right? Cause it, cause you haven't actually done anything wrong. <laughs> like, like even if we don't like cheating in a game, it's like, and so, for me, this thought that like reality could have that structure where you break the rules, but it doesn't really matter is, um, you know, I would want to be able to hold on to the thought that that's not the case, but I would want to be also be able to hold on to suits this thought that like the most important things are valued in themselves. And so then there's a question is, is a game really our best grip on the question of something's being valued in and of itself? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. Hey. Hey. Hi. Uh, my name is Miranda, and my question was about whether or not social media ultimately brings people together or keeps them apart by trying to satisfy us with like a sort of false intimacy, which I know we were talking about earlier. And the motivating factor for this is I was kind of thinking about how um, like I can't give my friends hugs, and the closest I can get to that is like sending them a heart emoji or something, which feels like really distant. But on the other hand, there's almost 600 people listening in right now. So at the end of the day, is social media or even just the internet in general bringing us together or keeping us apart? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a good question. It's like impossible to answer because I think for some people at some moments it brings them together and other times it pushes them apart. I mean, the idea of like sending a heart emoji is interesting, right? Because they're like, if I get a heart emoji from like a particular person, like that's going to create like an entire like emotional landscape for me that feels like almost like a hug in some ways, right? And if I get it from somebody else, maybe it's weird or 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 just it does nothing for me. Um, but there's like there's a haptic element, right? I mean, this word haptic meaning like there are things there are things that you could pick up visually that have almost a kind of like tactile effect on your body. Um, and I think if you spend a lot of time online, you start feeling that those kinds of haptic effects. Um, especially in, in moments of communication. Um, but I can think of a lot of examples in which like social media are both super connective and, and super depressing and, and disconnected. Yeah, I guess uh, my take on this would be social media is a space where we are still learning how to connect. And it's young, right? And so it looks like sucky in all the ways that things look when they're just getting started. And so if we compare how we relate to one another in social media versus how do we relate in our family lives and in our intimate relationships, et cetera, where those things are governed by like millennia of tradition in a sense that have informed like the very, very subtle structure of those interactions, right? And then we just made up a new thing. You know, it was like when they made up Esperanto or something, they made up this new language and it like just didn't have the subtlety of, you know, and it, and it didn't survive for that reason. But 
I guess I think the real question, for me, the interesting question is, how can we adapt ourselves to social media to make it more connecting, right? And what are the elements of it that are like working and what are not working and what works in what context? And it's like, so for me, even the fact that this platform exists between Zoom and Twitch, right? Um, that there's this space where it's like, we can like have you join us, but we can also relegate you to the chat section, right? And that, that movement back and forth and like be like, that's a fit with the kind of thing we're trying to do here. Like, I feel like a lot of thinking needs to go into that for social media is like, how how can we make the, um, how can we make it work for us? And it's almost like, how can we create the norms? Like there are just a bunch of norms that don't exist yet on social media. And that's part of what makes it free. It's like the wild west. Um, but over time, we're going to want to be developing those norms. The, communicative norms and like I think we as we do it'll feel like a richer connection and it'll also feel less free I mean it's interesting like let's take this moment as an example of this right like uh, over the last hour like I've seen comments that are directly and quickly responding to the conversation that we're having in video while there are like parallel conversations going on about Jordan Peterson and the Nash equilibrium yeah. um, at the same time and, and it's and it's like is that connective or disconnected? Um, when I see like parallel and unseparated conversations happening, I don't think of that as disconnection, right? I think of like people on chat as either multitasking or making like agential decisions about when to move in and out of attention, um, which to me is perfectly acceptable because it, it's a norm that I'm familiar with um, from being online in a lot of different contexts. And so like, if that were happening in physical space, right, the norm would be different. I would be like, oh no, like we're failing. Um, mm -hmm. The conversation isn't interesting enough. Like we need to do something different. But the fact that there's like this other kind of conversation happening right now, like I, I don't feel that. This is just a more complicated or differently complicated space. Yeah. Ashlyn, you have some questions for us? Oh, I have so many questions, uh, but you know, we'll keep it to the top four. Uh, so this question is from Marty, uh, Marnie Pickens. Loneliness motivates our impulse to seek out friendships and love relationships. So if we didn't experience loneliness, would we even seek those things? Do we need two different words, one for the kind of necessary loneliness that motivates other seeking, and then a different word for loneliness that can't find release or other seeking? Mm -hmm. That's interesting because we had distinguished between sort of solitude and loneliness where, where you could think of loneliness as unsuccessful solitude or something. But mm -hmm. what you're bringing out is that some forms of loneliness are productive. Like even that is where it's like you're, you're alone, but you don't want to be alone, but it's productive in that it motivates you. Right. Um, and so, so there are, um, there are forms of loneliness that are good because they, in a way, drive you outside yourself. Um, and so they're not good in the sense that they're solitude and you're happy to be alone. I think that's a really good distinction that I hadn't thought of. And I would agree with that. I think I, I sometimes do things to make myself a little bit miserable in a variety of ways, precisely because I think those forms of misery are like correctly going to gear me. For me, the, when Patrick, when you talk about boredom and like the good kinds of boredom, they're sort of like that of like, yeah. I'm, I'm watching something where it's kind of slow, but like I'm, I'm waiting for something. I'm in this um, mode of suspension and that that kind of unhappiness points out its outward beyond itself to something larger that I wouldn't be able to grip if I didn't allow myself that kind of um, negative experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in this context of one, one of our colleagues in English, uh, C.N. Nye, um, her first book, Ugly Feelings, was very much about, you know, the space of like negative affects and what it is that we get from negative affects um, that requires more attention and is maybe more productive, uh, even socially, than perhaps we acknowledge on a, on a regular basis. So I think something like loneliness in this context is definitely a good example. Or like, you know, like being a feminist killjoy or something like that, like like that could be a negative affect, but one that is like very politically enabling and and is also like personally enabling for the person who's engaging in that affect in so far as it allows them to survive or thrive um, within um, a situation or a society that's patriarchal or misogynist or something like that, right? So there there are like, like affects that are seen as, as negative that are nonetheless productive of a variety of things. And I think loneliness is one of those. For sure. Hmm. 
All right. Um, is suffering something that should be played? And this is a question from Brandon Murphy. Yeah, so, I mean, that makes us yeah, yeah, so ahead, like the, 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 the spent game. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I think suffering is something that can be simulated or played with. And, and, and I'm using the word play here as meaning something other than fun, right? Because there are a lot of video games that are playful and thought provoking without necessarily being fun. And I think it's a problem when those games claim to give you an experience of empathy, right? And, and claim to give you an experience of someone else's experience that took an entire lifetime of suffering to get to that you get to experience in five minutes or an hour or something like that. And I think that's the limit of playing with suffering. Um, but there's also a difference between like playing with suffering as a sadist and playing with suffering as a way of exploring somebody else's experience. And that latter thing is something that I think we do it, it, at liberal arts universities or you know the kinds of universities like the University of Chicago, where um, part of what you're doing during your four years as an undergraduate or your um, you know six plus years as a graduate student is um, like exploring different forms of life. But it's true. There's a thin line between like learning something and becoming a better person or making the world a better place versus like learning something and being exploitative. Um, and using somebody else's experience for personal gain. Um, so it just depends on the case for me. I don't know, what do you think, Agnes? So I've been reading these essays um, by um, this guy, jean Marie. He was um, uh, originally Austrian, but he changed his name to French um, at sort of, um, uh, he was a, a Holocaust survivor. He was sort of an intellectual in Vienna. Uh, as he'd written a novel, um, but then he um, joined the Belgian resistance, I think, was captured by um, the Gestapo, was tortured, and then was in concentration camps. And he wrote these essays about his experience being tortured in concentration camps. And um, they're about suffering, right? They're about the ways that he suffered. And he, and what they really are is a very frank statement that his suffering destroyed him, that it destroyed who he was and like that he was still destroyed. One thing that he says is he who is tortured stays tortured. And he's like, I'm still being tortured now, like 20 years later. And um, they're extremely moving and they are in a way you're reading them. And as a reader, you're fighting them. Cause you're like, no, no, you survived. You triumphed, you know, like they didn't destroy your spirit. And he's like, they destroyed my spirit. He committed suicide. He wrote his final book was about suicide. And then he committed suicide a few years after writing it. And at a certain point in reading these essays, I like, I almost felt them triumph over me in the sense of, I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I, um, um, I think you were destroyed. Like, I think I have to take you at your word, right? But part of what he's saying in those essays is like that there's a kind of almost blindness to suffering where like he doesn't feel like he understands his own suffering, especially well. Like suffering, does, he's like suffering does not make you wise. It doesn't give you knowledge. It doesn't give you understanding, right? It's It really is like a kind of destruction. And um. I think that, so I think one thing I would want to say is like, we shouldn't assume that the person who's suffering understands their suffering. <laughs> like it may be part of what's terrible about suffering is that it has a kind of blindness to it. Um, and um, um, which means like, of course you can't inhabit it very well either because inhabit it, like what you're trying to do maybe is understand it if you're reading the essay, right? And that's not at all the same thing as inhabiting it. But it may, it's possible that you could understand it better than the person who suffered it did, but you wouldn't be suffering it then because it's essential to the suffering of it that there's a kind of lack of understanding. So I think that that's quite complicated. It's quite complicated to think about what it might mean to empathize with versus to understand suffering and to what degree can it be understood. Um, but in terms of exploitation, I mean, I guess I think that most ways that you learn from other people are probably good. Um, but like that is, I'm very inclined to be, give people the benefit of the doubt on that one. But I suppose, I suppose that there are 
like you, there are ways you could leverage it that might be bad. Like that is not the understanding itself, but some kind of use to which you put it. Um, but yeah, I think there's also just a real question about who, if anyone can understand suffering. Totally. And, and, and what kind of suffering, right? I mean, here, like the example of like, um, you know, Frankel or, or like surviving a concentration camp, right? Like enters into the space of like trauma and like suffering within trauma is a very specific form of suffering that's different from like, say, um, da daily suffering um, within uh, unequal economic conditions or something like that, right? Which, which is like, um, which is like a slow burn or a slow death, which is a term that comes up sometimes. Um, but is but is different, right? And, and like to play with or write about fictionally or whatever, like trauma versus like everyday banal but real suffering, right? I mean, that that's also an interesting question. Uh, yeah. Like, what can can you ever convey trauma? Maybe, maybe not. Can you convey everyday suffering? Probably to some degree, depending on the re receptiveness of the person reading or playing or whatever the case might be. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, I, I really like your your examples and thinking about like like what becomes maybe not inevitable but incommunicable about what a form of suffering does to you fundamentally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Do we have? I, I'm, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, which which Frankel book were you talking? No, about? No, this is not Frankel. This is Jean Marie. Oh. But I mean, oh, sorry. it's the same. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah, he, yeah, was yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was Austrian, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, is there another question, Ashlyn? We have quite a few questions Maybe still let's, uh, let's left. Let's take one more. Do you want to do one more? Five minutes, yeah. Fantastic. So, um, We'll do the one from Ethan Yu. Um, his question, back to the topic of online communities. What do you think it means for our spiritual and religious spaces and communities moving online? Are we being religiously deprived if we don't have a physical sense of community or our religion only allows um, physical forms of necessary ritual? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, you know, last night was Passover. <laughs> we had a Passover Seder in my house and it wasn't that different from other Passovers because we normally just have Passover Seder in my house with my kids. And um, like in that sense of like, the, so, like a lot of people didn't get to do the Seders they would have done, um, but we did the Seder we would have done. And yet it still felt different. Like it still felt like, like there's that, you know, um, 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 like this year we are slaves, next year may we be free. Um, like next year may we be in Jerusalem. But that line, next year may we be free, all of us sort of felt it of like, yeah, we don't feel very free right now. Um, and we're not slaves, right? But we are constrained in this way. And um, I guess I think that um, it will, it sort of depends a lot on like what kind of community your religious expression is predicated on, right? And so, um, my own religious practice is very much like centered on my home and family. And so even though we still feel it, it I think we're, we feel it less maybe. We still have Shabbat, we still have Passover Seder. Um, but you know, the, yeah, the fact that like the synagogue, you can't go to the synagogue, you can't do certain kinds of group practice. Um, I don't, I honestly don't know. Like um, I don't know the answer and um, I, you know, I could see religiosity being something that surges at a time like this, um, um, because in general, you know, it maybe does so in a crisis where people are looking to what are the really important things. And then I could see it in the case of this crisis as sort of sinking because people are, don't have those religious communities and people are finding ways to, you know, connect with their religious communities online. But um, so I, I feel like I don't, I feel like my own experience is maybe somewhat idiosyncratic and then I could sort of see it going either way and I have a hard time knowing which way it would go. Yeah. I mean, the, the only thing that I'll add to this is I think it depends on the particular religious tradition or spiritual orientation that you have, right? So for instance, we're in a moment of uncertainty. Like we don't know um, precisely what the next weeks will be like or the next months will be like you know, when we get to leave our homes, like how, like whether we'll flatten the curve or whatever, 
or whether some of us will have jobs on the other end or things like that, right? There are a lot of forms of uncertainty. And uncertainty to me connects to how I understand faith personally, which is it's very different from something like dogmatism or fundamentalism, which is a an orientation of knowing and certainty. Like for me, faith has always been about um, negotiating and mediating uncertainty, which is like in some senses similar to facing the uncertainty of the pandemic right now. Um, I mean, there are of course like countless religious practices in which one can have, you know, conversations online in the way that we're having right now, or in which one can like delve into religious texts or philosophical texts um, and uh, gain in terms of introspection and reflectiveness that might not be available otherwise. I mean, you're obviously losing the same forms of community that secular people or, or, or people in other realms are losing as well. Um, but I think that there are like all, always ways forward for any community. Yeah, good. I wanted to say one thing on the uncertainty point, which I liked a lot. I had been puzzling over, I'm, I've am i been reading a lot of apocalypse novels, you know, like the Rose, Station Eleven, all these. Um, yeah. And a lot of people are doing this. A lot of people are reading apocalypse novels. And, and I wrote something in the New York Times about this. Why are we doing this? Why are we torturing ourselves? And I, re I heard a podcast um, uh, in which an author said, um, you know, the thing with the no like apocalypse novel is that you find out what happens in the end. Like you read the novel and there, it might be horrible, but at least you get to know what happens in the end. And we have this feeling right now of, I want to know what happens after the pandemic. And so you could read a novel about a pandemic and then you find out what happens afterwards. And so uh, that struck me as like very right that like we're in a situation of uncertainty and we are um, sort of gravitating towards context in which some kind of feeling of understanding or knowledge is made available to us, that that's very attractive. Um, and it can be in a religious context or it can be in a novel. Um, okay, it's eight o'clock. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to everyone who came today and chatted and asked questions. And thank you so much to Patrick and Ashlyn. Um, and um, hopefully see many of you next week. Thank you so much, Agnes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments and questions. I'm going to scroll through them and actually look at some more that I missed just by virtue of listening to Agnes. <laughs> okay. Bye. Go. Thank you, Ashlyn.